Let's do it. Pablo, what's up, man? It's uh, good to be speaking with you again. It's as we were just mentioning, it's been a while, over a year. I it's think, it's been just about it's, a year. It's, it's it's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah, it's great. Great to be here. Great to be talking to you, man. I always, always enjoy our conversations. Yeah, me too. And uh, we've talked, you know, when we get together, we talk about a lot of different things. But uh, the last year, or not even the last year, the last six months, I guess, has been very interesting in the world of Noster. And, you know, we, we can definitely talk about whatever we want to here today. But one of the main reasons I wanted to have you on is because I've been like, pretty away from all sorts of social media lately. I just, as we were just kind of reflecting on our lifestyles, it, it, it's just increase, increasingly less important or like it's less relevant when we have all the things that we were discussing. And, um, but when I do go on there, especially on Noster, I see a lot of you just being super excited about what's happening in Noster, what you're building in Noster. And so I figured, you know, for me to kind of make up for for not paying attention for the last six months, uh, I could have a chat with you and you could get me up to speed. So um, maybe, I mean, maybe for people that, you know, don't know, you can just introduce, you know, who you are and what you do, and then we'll break into the specifics of what's going on in Nostraland. Perfect. Uh, okay. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, my name is Pablo. I'm uh, a developer. I've been pretty much a developer my whole life. <laughs> um, always very excited about, about open source software and and the what what technology can do for freedom. It's a, a something that has always interested me very, very much. Uh, and I'm, I'm from Argentina, which I, I think in in very many in many ways it has shaped how I see uh software and how I see technology. Um and yeah, now I live um, <laughs> a world schooling life. So I, I travel the world with with my family. Uh, we don't travel like every two weeks or something, but but yeah, we try to go to beautiful places with beautiful communities that that we can integrate with. And I got into Bitcoin maybe yeah a few years ago, um, around 2017, and uh, I was absolutely enamored and it, it took a long time for me to understand bitcoin to understand why it's different from all these other things um i, I think my my orange peeling journey took probably around three years uh of listening to stefan Oliveira mainly <laughs> because i went yeah i was into austrian economics way before bitcoin like i read human action in 2006 way way wow. way before i ever heard of bitcoin so i understood all that part but <laughs> it took me listening to stefan uh to make the connection between austrian economics and bitcoin <laughs> i i hadn't seen it un until that and when i started hearing him uh i i thought why how is this related uh but you know, like now it's obvious but <laughs> it's super interesting when you are very deep in in one thing that you lose a little bit of perspective <laughs> well i think that's the case with a lot of the so-called libertarian and cap Austrian folks, you know, and my, and this is a very biased sort of uh, perspective because it's just basically based on Twitter and some of my meat space interactions, but it does seem that there's some kind of, like you said, some kind of blockage for a lot of that crowd. Like maybe they're too deep in some aspect of that, that they can't, I don't know, they can't see the logic or they, they, they can't see the validity of, of what Bitcoin represents and they end up kind of missing it, which is ironic because Bitcoin is kind of like the distillation of that philosophy in form. And it's so weird that that would be a group that that doesn't get it immediately. I think it's it's liber libertarian theory applied to something. Right, right. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I tend to think that th there, there are a couple of things. I, I think crypto, like all the shit coins have done, uh, enormous, enormous harm to the understanding of Bitcoin and, and the confusion that that, that they bring, um, which pretty much captures us all. Uh, it, it's very strange to meet someone who understands, really understands Bitcoin without having gone through a, through a shitcoin phase. Um, and, on, and on the other hand, I think they, you have the effect of people that have been thinking about these political problems, uh, and they cannot see an economical solution that completely invalidates politics, which mm. is what Bitcoin does, right? There is no governance in Bitcoin. Um, but they've they just been mm, bitching <laughs> pretty much about the size of government and asking for political solutions to diminish the size of government. And those solutions will never, 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 never yield results. But it, it's hard to 
it's hard to reassess. I think changing your mind is one of the <laughs> is one of the life skills that are very hard to to conquer that you have to continuously work on. Mm. Uh, but it requires a lot of uh, uh, humbleness. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, and that that crowd is also <clears throat> they're clutching their gold bars too, and you know they're so invested both like mentally and financially in that being at least a big part of their supposed solution that I think, you know, it disincentivizes them or, or causes them to maybe miss what's really going on in Bitcoin. Um, but so when did you, were you in Argentina when you got Bitcoin or had you already been like moving around? No, no, it's, it's funny because, uh, in 2000, uh, 2011 or 12, I, I, so I was living in, in Virginia in Blacksburg, uh, and I decided I, I decided to start a company. And I said, okay, I'm going to move back to Argentina because of, you know, cheap-ish labor, uh, but skilled cheap-ish labor. And, and I'm just going to, yeah, create this company. So it started going kind of well. I, I, I created my team, got within one year uh, of starting the company. It was uh, a team of 15 people that I hired. Uh, I was like, no investment, no nothing. It was just me. And, and then a bunch of people that I started hiring. And, and then the, um, <laughs> the income for my company was in the, in the States. My, my company was registered in Delaware. And, and to pay salaries, I would have to either get a wire transfer from the States to Argentina, get 50% of the funds confiscated by the bank, <laughs> <laughs> immediately and then have to prove via paperwork have to prove that it's not money laundering that is you know it's all it's all uh cool with that with that with that cash so obviously i did never did that because why would i so instead what i started doing is flying to this to, to the states every two or three months buying a bunch of iphones then crossing the border with the iphones just glued to my body what like yeah, 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 like my chest, my back, my legs, everywhere, iPhones. Uh, and then... Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> so, but like, wouldn't they see that in security? You go through the metal detector? No, 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 no. So, crazy? no, no, no. So, that, so that's the thing. I, I could get into the flight fr in, in States with just the, the iPhones in my backpack, right? Like, no worries. But then... Uh, this is all allegedly. I'm not confessing to any crimes here. This is what <laughs> so, someone might do. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, but then when you go to get your suitcases and all that stuff, I would just go to the um, to the bathroom and then put all the iPhones all over the place. Or when you exit uh, in Argentina. When you when I exit in Argentina, that's right. So then when you exit in Argentina, you have to drop into like the X-ray machine, the all the bags and all that right. stuff. But there is right. no X-ray machine for you as a person. You know, um, so <laughs> that's that was, wow. that was what I was doing. And then just when you go to Buenos, when I get to Buenos Aires, I will just sell all the iPhones at a brutal premium um, and use that to pay salaries. <laughs> you mean at a, um, at a, at a discount? You'd oh, no, 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 no. iPhones. No, no, no. I would oh, buy there's a big say, an iPhone. Oh, there's a huge markup because no one can get iPhones into the country. Like oh, shit. at scale, so you'd make, you cannot you'd get make iPhones. money on doing it this way. I would make money. So, so the the markup would usually pay for my trip back and forth and the lodging for a couple of days. Wow. Um, oh, it's yeah, absolutely insane. But see, this is the kind of thing that people are pushed to to do when there are stupid, idiotic regulations. Mm. I, I did not want to do this stuff. <laughs> like I wanted to work on making my business better, uh, right. but I had, to, I had to pay these, these tax, if you will, of having to do these stupid things to get around this regulation. Um, obviously, if I had known Bitcoin, that solved <laughs> my use case. I didn't know about Bitcoin at the time. <laughs> I wish I had. Um, but, but yeah, no, I, I left Argentina in 2013 again, uh, because I, I left Argentina in 2001 and then I went back for, to make this company, then inflation killed my company and I moved to Boston to start something different. And, and that, yeah, what uh, was the after company? a while the the first one it was a, like a super idiotic idea. Uh, the first one was my thesis was that cloud computing was going to make starting companies very easy. Uh, very simple, which is is it is the case, uh, especially starting you know like software 
companies. But the maintenance of ri running databases and running your your uh, Apache server or any kind of server that you run uh, was not going to scale at the same time because of because of labor cost. So my my company the idea of my company was I'm going to provide like the cloud part uh, of the of that human labor. Uh, which was a bad idea because at the end of the day, technology um, moved in the direction where you don't need uh, see, uh, like DevOps and people managing your databases on a regular basis, uh, especially doing maintenance and stuff like that. So the thesis was borked. My company did it die because of this is what's working was it died because of inflation <laughs> and how did how did inflation kill it specifically like you just oh well i just could not pay with salaries like the the income that i was receiving was not growing at the same uh pace to keep up with inflation so um at I had to pay a number of salaries in pesos and the pesos were the number of pesos that I would have to pay for the employees to, you know, have like keep their, their, their uh, life uh, standards. Th that number was going, growing way faster than I could uh, increase revenue in dollars. But it's, but you're not talking about like in a minimum wage sort of thing. You just mean they would. Oh, no, 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 no. I was paying. I mean, no, no, no. I mean, I, was paying... I, mean, I mean, you're not, you're not being forced to pay more and therefore can't afford it. You're just saying you couldn't keep up with wage inflation. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's not that I was, I wasn't able to meet like a regulatory level or something, but you, I needed to pay an amount, like a salary that my employees would be able to have the, uh, a regular life. Right. Right. Um, I mean, Otherwise it, it's a, it's a, it's a good example. I, I think back then in two and 2011 ish, I was paying around maybe I can't remember the exact number. Maybe it was like five thousand pesos or or eight thousand pesos, something something like that. Right now, that number five thousand pesos. You go and buy cookies with that, right? Um, and it used to be a, a normal salary, like a good salary for an engineer. <laughs> Can I ask you this? Uh, like, so I, I went to Argentina in. 2003, I think, or four. Um, and like, you know, Argentina has kind of had a long history of being an economic and financial basket case, right? Like several defaults and inflation mm -hmm. episodes and that kind of stuff. I know this is probably a difficult question to answer. And, and obviously they all share the same fate to some degree and everyone's moronic and all that kind of stuff. But why Argentina specifically is like amongst the worst in terms of managing currency and economic policy and stuff like that. Do you have any insight on that? That's a really hard question. Um, <laughs> the the theory that pops to mind is that uh, Argentina, <laughs> Brazilians are going to love this. Argentinians tend to think of themselves as very superior to the rest of Latin America. Um, so there is a lot. I mean, our, Buenos Aires used to be called the Paris the of, Paris of, the Paris of yeah of Latin America. Yeah, yeah. and. And it used to be like that because Argentina, Buenos Aires was the port that that all received all trade from from Europe in the 1700s. Oh, you can tell it's a, it's a there's gorgeous elements of that city. You know, it's, it's it it's it's very interesting because it's a city that you can tell that it was absolutely ransacked by communism because it was a city that looked beautiful. You mm -hmm. go to Teatro Colón, and Teatro Colón is like this magnificent work of art. It's absolutely gorgeous. And there are many, many places where you walk, around, walk around in Buenos Aires and you, you think that you are in the best part of Paris or, or something like that. But then you, you walk around some more and then you see the communism has completely taken over, completely. Um, and it's, it, it, it has infected the roots of the, of the, of the society there. Uh, so I, I gave a talk back in, I, I think it was like, yeah, 2011 or 12 or so. Uh, I went to a, to a school, like, um, uh, what's it called? Like a high school for adults at night, a night school or something. Sure. Maybe. Yeah. So I gave a talk to, to the kid, uh, to the kids. I mean, they were, they were like my age. Um, but it, it was very, very, very poor people that were, it was structural po poverty. Right, like their families and their their everybody they they knew were super super poor, 
<laughs> they gave a talk about entrepreneurship <laughs> because you can't be an entrepreneur, right? Like it, it doesn't it doesn't demand any kind of degree <laughs> or anything. It just requires being proactive and having imagination. Um, and there were many, many kids whom I, I could tell that what I was talking about resonated with them. But then they approached me and they, like, but like a few kids asked me, but what do you mean work? <laughs> because they were not familiar with the concept of work. So I asked him, okay, what does your father do? Well, I don't know. He watches TV. Well, but like, how does he pay for things? Well, someone comes and gives him money. Okay, what did your grandfather do? I mean, the same thing. <laughs> These are generations of people who have never witnessed work. <laughs> I guess um, part of the broader question too, as part of that is like, notwithstanding most countries devolve into socialism or communism, right? Because everyone gets used to those handouts that you're referring to. And, and, and everyone gets trained to think, oh, the government is how problems are solved. And you just end up spiraling downward. But it does seem like Latin America has a particular penchant for socialism or communism, or at least the, the the speed at which they devolve into it. I mean, even maybe right now we're in kind of one of those moments where you have, I think Colombia, Chile, uh, and, and Brazil just elected like socialist communist uh, leaders, did they not? Now, what's interesting, and after you, I want to talk about this Javier, Javier so someone guy in Argentina. Oh, Mi Mi Millet. Millet, You're right, yeah. because he's like apparently a hardcore Austrian dude. He's talked about Bitcoin before, and he's doing well in the in the polls. And I think the election is in a, in October. But anyways, can you know continue what you were saying, and we'll we'll dive into that afterwards. No, yeah. So um, I, I forgot what my my what you were saying. Uh, in oh yeah, so the reason why is the structural kind of mentality of like people give you things. Yeah, and 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 the thing, I mean. Yes, that that the is true things. throughout the throughout throughout the world, right? Uh, so that's definitely not special to to Argentina, um, but I, I think our Argentinians, uh, I, I guess there's a factor of randomness, which what happened in Argentina could have happened everywhere and, and does happen uh, in other places. But I, yeah, I don't know. I I wonder if Argentina with the um, this instinct of this superiority that Argentinians usually feel. Um, blinds them from, hey, maybe this is not the best place in the world. Maybe what we're doing is not the most logical, <laughs> sensible thing to do. Um, because I, I did see that uh, approach throughout my life. I, I remember when I was a kid, I, I used to absolutely hate Argentina and think, I don't belong in this place. Like, I, I don't belong with, with this framework of, of thinking about the world of whatever you do, there is no meritocracy of any kind. Whatever you do is right. <laughs> whatever you do, if you didn't work too hard, then that's the right way of doing things. And there is in Argentina, there is um there is a large appeal to uh uh, we, we, we call it ser vivo, uh, being like the wise guy, right? If you can get away with not doing work, that's the person that is the most admired. Like throughout the entire society, society that is super, super, super common. The people that are like the famous people that the most admired people is all around not working hard. Like if you work hard and you earned what you get, like your lifestyle, whatever it might be, then you're kind of like a schmuck. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, how, how does that square with, so you have that mentality, however it developed over the years, but how does, how do those people then assess or judge the fact that their currency has, you know, been so horrible over the number of years like it's fine to have that kind of mentality and that kind of political or economic philosophy but when your currency loses 50 percent 75 percent 100 percent in a year and that dramatically affects your savings like doesn't that cause people to reassess those positions or how, how not, do people not, not really because if because if you think from the framework that everything argentinians do is the best it can be uh then you think well then if our situation sucks it must be someone else's fault and the IMF has always been pointed as the bad guy, um, which to me, always the fact that Argentinians had a, like a knee-jerk reaction against the IMF made me think, okay, maybe the IMF then are the good guy <laughs> in some way. <laughs> um, 
but but yeah no i mean in in argentina the common thing is that it's the fault of the of the shankies the you know us it's the fault of the of the spaniards argentinians absolutely despise people from spain absolutely the spaniards they don't even know that argentinians hate spain argentinians absolutely despise brazilians brazilians for like i Try to mess with uh, with NBK, and he doesn't even buy because he doesn't even know there is like this rivalry. <laughs> <laughs> and so, is it is it indicative at all of a shift in that mentality that someone like Javier is, at least according to the polls, like doing all right in the in this upcoming election? Like, is there his message is obviously resonating to some degree. <laughs> I, I, don't I don't know how much I, you I follow want... all this, by the way. I'm just asking you because you're Argentinian. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not following. So every time I call my mom, she she told talk to me right, about inflation right, right. and then Javier Milei. So I'm I'm aware of what's going on through the lens of my my mother telling me things about Javier Milei. I don't know. I don't really care about politics. I don't think politics will ever be the solution to anything. Um. So you know whatever. Uh, yeah, ho hope hope it goes well. I, I think what what's indicative is that the the um, so Argentina used to have the Peroni, the Peronist party. I I guess no one cares about this. So, <laughs> but but Argentina used to have the the uh, Peronist party with Peron in the in the sixties, uh, which was yeah, it, it's a very strange party because it it had uh components of the left and components of the right. Um, he was like a dictator, but appealed a lot to, to the left. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of weird. But in the early 2000s, that party, like everything went to shit and that party split into a bunch of different segments. Um, so all the major parties other than uh, Cambiemos, which is the party that was in power before uh, the current president, uh, they had these extreme communist tendency. Uh, I think maybe Javier Millet is a representation of we've been trying this shit for so long. <laughs> maybe it's not working. But again, it's 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 all politics at the end of yeah. the day, right? Like the, and Argentinians keep waiting for some savior to come and you know fix things and no one's coming. <laughs> Absolutely right. no one. <laughs> right. And you know I say that all the time. The best you know, perspective to have is that no one's coming to save you. And if you get a couple like bumps or layups along the way where someone half sensible comes into power and that makes your life a little bit easier then great. Right. But that's not what you should put all your, you know, you shouldn't put all your chips in that basket. All right. In terms of just the practicalities though, when, it, when a currency is inflating at hundred percent a year, like you mentioned, you have family there still, it seems. And like, how do people manage that? Like, what is the response? And there's, a lot of capital controls too, right? So how do people uh, insulate themselves or manage like that scenario? Take out the politics, who cares? You know, no control over that. But like, how are people managing with their save, you know, their cat, their money being so devalued? I I tend to think that that people are incredibly more resilient than because the fact that all decisions are made at the edges, at the margins, and and not as a as a whole. It means that every decision that you make might not take into account how fucked the overall situation is, right? You're making this decision of, should I buy this orange? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I don't know. I've seen people go through very, very, very harsh circumstances in life, and, and they just pull through. One time I hired um, one guy from that was living in, in Israel, and he was very close to the border with uh, with Gaza. And I was, you know, curious. So I asked him about, you know, like the conflict and, and how do you live under like a constant threat, right? Regardless of, you know, like the situation with Gaza or Palestine or whatever, like I was just interested in his perspective, like this life perspective. And and he told me, well, you do see missiles flying every like frequently, but like you get used to it. You're <laughs> you going just, somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> we'll, we'll just go to the grocery store anyway, because we need to buy shit. And yes, yeah, like whatever, man, like there are missiles flying over our heads, but like you need to do things in life, right? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Like in 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 my in my circumstance, in, in me in particular, I I send, I 
pay for some of the stuff that my my mom needs you know mm -hmm. uh i just send her bitcoin every 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 month uh to pay so for example healthcare um her healthcare bill is 80% more than she gets as the pension like uh, her yeah like wow. you know the, the yeah so obviously <laughs> she can't she can't afford healthcare and you know she needs it so so i like pay send her bitcoin and then she sells it um but yeah i i don't know man every um i think every every life has a different uh every person has a different way of dealing with it um yeah i i don't know it's um yeah it's it's very strange but i think people are incredibly incredibly resilient yeah i mean does that particular instance because you would think in places like that bitcoin and unfortunately probably crypto would at least be part of a solution part of a workaround but is is it not the case that argentina in response to imf dangling the carrot for you know basically another bailout just came down hard on on bitcoin and crypto and is that going to make it more difficult to buy and sell it in the country and use it for those purposes i mean argentina has been under capital controls for 20 years our argentinians know very 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 well how to navigate those those waters um so that's <laughs> uh, the argentina has been trying to ban the use of the us dollar for like two decades um and every time they ban one what we call it cueva is a, is a place where you go and and trade on the black market uh quote unquote for the listeners uh when you when you trade dollars it's it's like an illegal trade and you are actually getting the real price of of the dollar and those cuevas started selling bitcoin as well um i don't know when, whenever you do this kind of silly bans it, it it never works because it's like banning the air it's and but banning bitcoin is even harder right like banning the dollar is because it's physical uh mm -hmm. it's i mean obviously the banking rails don't count because you cannot use banking rails with with dollars in argentina it's absolutely <laughs> absolutely impossible but but even the the physical dollars are 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 available if you I, and, and everybody knows where to go it's it's not hard to find a, a cueva every once in a while they storm a cueva and they make a show and you know like they arrest very violently a bunch of people that are working there but you know it's like pirate bay the next day there are four five more <laughs> right would you ever move back if things changed there or became more sensible or anything like that it's because it's a no, beautiful I, country I, I, I right i just don't like the ethos uh no i I would just not go back. It, it's yeah, and just you don't think that so... could change? Oh, no way. <laughs> no, cultural momentum is so hard to change. Uh, yeah, that's why I think this time for Nostra is so special. But I, I think the momentum of culture takes literally generations to be able to be changed. Um, in Argentina, I don't even get a sense that there is... Um, there is an an interest in changing that that momentum so no i definitely definitely not uh not very very bullish and i would would not see myself living there at all regardless feel, of like the economic crisis and all that right where do you think in the world today has a you know an interesting or positive culture and i guess like we're we're kind of in this in the stage of history where we delineate between meat space and you know, <laughs> so, it's soft space basically, because, you know, there's obviously legitimate bounded delineated cultures happening in cyberspace. Uh, but you know, where, where do you think is like a culture that's at least acceptable for, you know, the things that you value in the world today? They the, don't have to the, dox the... anything, but <laughs> no, the places that, that I've seen that have an ethos that resonates with me the most are smaller places rural places out of the um out of the way places where it's hard to get to um where you don't get like we've seen this the, and we don't have to touch on it but this this culture the, like this global culture if you will uh of caring about like the most simple and silly things that are non-existent problems uh or mini miniscule problems mm -hmm. that everybody has to have an opinion about now. Right. And there are so many places in the world when you get out of 
Austin or when you get out of like big cities that don't even realize that there are people talking about these things. Like right. it's it's not part of the reality. <laughs> and the life so nice. that you can have <laughs> it's so it's so fresh man it's so incredibly refreshing to like not what do you mean to... you just want to talk about the fish you caught today and the bread you made and the dinner you're having later and not like pronouns and politics and whatever the fuck else like wow it's <laughs> so nice i want to be your friend <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's so funny because in in the place where i'm at now it's like this small island in greece and it's the climbing mecca in, in the world so climbers from all over the world come for you know one or two weeks uh to to climb here and because because of you know people from all over the world there's a lot of the pronoun people coming here but the the, the gap of understanding between uh, you know i i uh, i am not a woman even though i'm obviously a woman or the, it's so large that the locals which obviously the locals um a lot of them don't speak english other than people you know um clerks and you know um waitress and stuff like that um <laughs> the gap is so large that it's doesn't compute. There is no communication. Yeah, it doesn't compute. There, there is no mind virus of oh no. Every once in a while, I see I see people come in and say and create a, a change.org petition to change something in the island, and it's always written by people who've been here for a week. <laughs> They're leaving the second week, and they want to say, oh no, we need to save uh, this island. <laughs> Okay, good luck. <laughs> yeah, people are like, you can leave now. <laughs> yeah. You've been here Thank long you. enough. Uh <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I always come back to on you know, on the I was thinking today actually, and, and often I guess, because it's like you're saying in certain areas in the mainstream discourse, you know, not in those faraway places, these sorts of issues, whether they be those or climate related or socialist, you know, economic policies, uh, are so ever present. And you know, I always come back to that Buckminster Fuller, Buckminster Fuller quote, you know, like you, you don't change the world by like screaming against something you, you make the problem obsolete. And it really is the case that entrepreneurs and innovators are the, the real social justice warriors, right? Not the people that just point out the problem and say the end is nigh. And you know, what we need is more communism. It's the people that identify the problem and say, well, I'm, I'm going to isolate the problem and I'm going to see if, what I can do to generate or develop a solution to it. And that will be the thing that actually improves people's lives or enhances convenience or makes people more pros prosperous or whatever. But for some reason that, you know, that's just a very difficult concept for a large portion of people to seemingly wrap their heads around. So we, we get, I, the, I think uh, there's, there, there's a large instinct in, in people. And I have no idea whether this is a, uh, uh, modern disease, modern mental disease, or not, but there, there is a large instinct on people to to always crave for some kind of top down solution. Yeah. And everybody, even even uh, for themselves, they they think in in terms of top down solutions, like oh they should ban this, or oh this should not be possible, or we should be able to do X. Right. Um, it, it's always. It, it's always the the um, the instinct is to solve a problem, but by changing a law or by yelling at someone or by not yelling at someone. Um, but no problem can be solved by, by top down solutions. Like by definition, top down solutions will always be authoritarians. Yeah. Uh, and the only thing that you can is what Jordan Peterson says, right? Like the only thing you can change is your room, like <laughs> make it, make your bed, uh, fix, fix your own things and fix the, the world, the, the part of the world that surrounds you. And maybe you can start expanding that circle later, uh, but fix your own stuff. And there is so rewarding to be able to modify, have the agency to, to modify things around you and, and have a positive, positive impact. You don't have to be, you know, named, um, emperor of Twitter uh, to be able to change the world. Yeah. Well, and that's such a per perfect point is because like, it's, it, it's far more impactful to change something in your local environment. And, you know, like not, no single person can really change the world, quote unquote, whatever that means, like save the world, but you can 
affect change in your local environment, even if that's just helping a neighbor or, you know, making it easier for, you know, helping your community in some way. And that's like genuinely a quality of life increase because all those people that you interact with on a daily basis benefit in some capacity and, you know, and, and that's felt, but it's funny you, you, because another aspect of this is what we were talking about earlier with like the libertarian crowd. It's like, everyone has blind spots. That's just a truth, right? And you try to be open-minded and objective and rational and logical to try to minimize those blind spots. And you try to find the right philosophy that allows and perspective on things that causes things to kind of fit together the best. And that's, you know, an attempt to, to minimize those blind spots, but you just, you can't avoid them. And, you know, you bring up Peterson and, you know, it's funny that one of his major shticks is like, the, the dangers of authoritarian centralized top-down control, right? And so bring it down to a local basis, clean your room, and then expand out from there. But simultaneously, like you know, when you observe his responses to emerging so-called problems in the world today, whether it's online identity or more recently, um, you know, the, the, the emerging dangers or pitfalls of artificial intelligence, his response is so often to like to uh, invoke government authority to like mm -hmm. try to negate or like restrict the negative impact of this thing. Like with AI, he was someone posted a picture of someone who was photorealistic and, you know, the person wasn't actually there. It might have been Selena Gomez at the Met or something. And um, he was like, you know, we need like we need laws immediately because this is going to be dangerous. And it's like, bro. This is totally <laughs> antithetical to your whole shtick. Like, can't you see that you're falling for the same trap, the very trap that you often very emotionally, like, and aggressively uh, criticize in other domains? You're making the same mistake here. You're jumping right to the conclusion that what we need is someone on high to make a law, to coerce someone not to do a thing, rather than finding a technological solution to what is a technological problem. You know, and so it's it's bizarre to me. You know, that's that's obviously a blind spot to him, or it seems to be one. You know, to me, it it's a, it's. I, I think it's just instinct. It's the instinct is there, and for the most part, I think the instinct might be part of human nature, or What's it might be a, like to authority. Auth the, authority is is the is is the easy solution. So, say for example, right. you you are um you know at um at a cliff and you jump and you die right because you fell from from the cliff. Well. The instinct is, well, it should be forbidden for people to die from jumping on cliffs. <laughs> okay, then it should there should be some kind of um, guard to to prevent people from from jumping. But it's it's the it's the low hanging fruit. It's like the level one thinking is okay. This should be forbidden. The which it's idiotic. <laughs> you cannot forbid people from interacting with software in some way because okay, maybe this software doesn't allow it. But if it's physically possible, someone might write it and someone might interact with that software in that way. So that's that's not the that's not the the solution. Um but I, I think these things require uh training and constant uh self-assessment of of your of your uh responses, your knee-jerk reactions. Um because I, I done I, I think we we discussed this at some point, but I think you also done uh, meditation, right? Yeah, I've I've experimented with it. I don't currently do it. So, so I think the whole point, at least from my perspective, uh, my approach to meditation is to become less reactive. Um, is to observe your sensations and acknowledge that something is itching or that you have some discomfort, and just observe that thing, that sensation, but without scratching yourself or without you know moving around. Uh, there is a, a concept called uh, aditana, which is I, I will sit down to meditate and I will not move. <laughs> I will sit down to meditate for three hours. And even if my back hurts, I will just sit still um, with, <laughs> within reason, I've, I've found. Um, <laughs> but the whole point is to learn to separate yourself from this input and the output that, that you create. But... <laughs> You might go and meditate for one hour and feel all enlightened and all, and then you go out and you see your daughter breaking something. I mean, daughter breaking something. I'm like, oh my god, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> that whole wonderful enlightened practice goes out the window in a split second. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, 
but you know, maybe after one hour of having that reaction, you connect that you were super reactive, and then maybe it will take less and less time for you for you to go from having the input and connecting an output uh, to the point where maybe you can, in some cases, break that um, that that response, that knee jerk reaction. Yeah, no, I agree with that. <clears throat> I've always, you know, meditation or, or anything that kind of allows you to create that space between an impulsive or an emotional reaction or a sensorial or a reaction to a sensorial input, like an itch or whatever. And, you know, the observer behind that, right? And I think, you know, you just, as you, you emerge in the world and as you're, you go through your cultural, familial, all those sorts of conditioning, you tend to associate the two with each other. Like I am that thought, I am that emotion mm -hmm. that scratches mine. And I think various practices can allow you to widen that gap between the two and you become more of an objective observer of all these different things. And, you know, if you do that well enough, then perhaps you are able to, the gap can be so large that even though you, you like the spark of that emotional response, you can tell when it's happening, but maybe you can, you know, uh, put it out before it is actually expressed, you know, and all, all the better, because then you're, you're perhaps acting more calmly, more consciously, more thoughtfully to your environment and not so emotionally and not so reactively. And, you know, nobody's perfect. So we all, we all fail at that. Um, unless you're like a monk in a cave for 30 years in silence, but then, yeah, but then maybe uh, you come out of to the real world. And well, exactly. <laughs> like, exactly. That's, this that's is not, really horrible. Person. That's not that impressive because you're not dealing with like rush hour traffic in New York and a shitty boss and, you know, five kids and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Um, and for, for, for the record, you know, obviously massive Peterson fan, not trying to throw shade because I've learned a ton from him, but, you know, I do think it's an example of that thing that everyone's susceptible to where you don't recognize when, you know, in certain instances, you're kind of being the opposite of what you espouse in other areas. But this perhaps is an excellent unintentional segue into the Nostra stuff, because basically the premise of Nostra, and as you said, what brought you into Bitcoin and studying Austrian economics before was, you know, a philosophy or an idea or a recognition of the value of freedom, broadly speaking, to express yourself, to transact, to act in accord with, you know, what you believe to be right, for lack of a better term or for lack of a, a broader term. And so it's interesting that, well, not interesting. I think it's great that we have these tools that are emerging in tandem with perhaps growing authority, that, that authoritarian instinct that you mentioned before, perhaps getting expressed even more in the world today because of the architecture of institutions that prevails, you know, that, that people's will or people's power or, or, power generally and money is being increasingly con concentrated at those centers of authority. And as you say, it's largely because people are granting it that and willingly granting it that. But we would probably both agree that that is ultimately detrimental to human freedom, flourishing, peace, prosperity, all that kind of stuff. And then simultaneously to that, or as a reaction to that, perhaps, we have these largely digital systems and landscapes that are trying to counterbalance that, that are trying to make it so people can express themselves how they want. They're trying to make it so people won't be financially or informationally or otherwise censored or deplatformed or any of that kind of stuff. And it's interesting, and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll dig into the details of all that, but in, just it kind of related to this Peterson point, let me, I'll, I'll put it this way, make, maybe this is a better analogy. You know, the gun debate always rages, right? You know, so there's a horrible tragedy somewhere and, a, you know, half the people say the problem is obviously guns. No gun, if there's less guns, less tragedy, let's remove them. The other half say, no, it's not the gun's fault. It's mental health. It's social conditioning. It's cultural. And, you know, guns need, there, there needs to be a way for the citizens to defend themselves and to, to represent a check on the balance of power of government. It's super important. We can't infringe on it. And the, these places, you know, that debate is just so polarized. It doesn't really get anywhere. Mm -hmm. And then you have into this landscape slipping 3D printed guns. So now a software file and a generic plastic printer make basically, or will, you know, very shortly make that debate almost moot. Cause it's like, well, who, you know, who cares? Anyone, anywhere will, will be able to print guns. 
So, you know, the debate is no longer should we have them or not, because they'll be ubiquitous, or at least the capacity for them to be ubiquitous will be there. So then where does the, the discussion move when that's the case? Well, I'd say it moves to probably a better place, like kind of an, like the place around culture, responsibility, family, education, you know, virtue, all that kind of stuff. And it seems like that's what Noster and freedom, you know, software and technologies represent. It's like, sure, the world is in a weird place where there's, you know, people want more authority to take care of the, you know, so-called problems that are emerging. But then you have this force that's basically going to say, doesn't matter what you think anyways. These ideas are going to get out there. These pictures are going to get out there. These songs, whatever. It's all going to be out there. So so then what? What happens when the authority is is no longer, uh, it loses its power, no, lo no longer has the influence that it, it once had? So, you know, what what do you make of the seemingly emerging tide or rising tide of freedom technologies, especially insofar as how Nostra has kind of poured fuel on that fire. I think it, it's funny because when you go to, when you go to Nostra, very often you see people that are super stoked about trying Nostra and we've, we've got this, uh, this safe space to get out of uh, Elon's uh, <laughs> tyranny. And then they have this one bad experience with someone and they say, well, can, can we ban this guy? And it's, it's <laughs> the instinct is let's ban this person because he was mean to me or because maybe he said something absolutely disgusting and you have no desire to be whatsoever to be uh, involved with that, with that person. But then you have tools to just block that person and not see, like mute that person and not, not interact with that person. But unless you kill the person, <laughs> the person is going to be there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I tend to think that, that, Bitcoin, because I used to equate Bitcoin with freedom. I thought there were synonyms. Um, and that's why I got the, the Bitcoin tattoo, because I have like this climber tattooed uh, and the climber is reaching for, for a Bitcoin logo. And my, 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 <laughs> my, 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 my pitch for the, for, the, for the tattoo is that the climber is reaching for freedom. Can and, I see it? And Bitcoin Can you roll just, up your sleeve? Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Very nice. Is that is that in is that in like a yin yang sort of half of a Yeah, my, my wife has the other half. <laughs> nice. Very cool. Um so and and recently I've started I've been thinking a lot about about uh Nostor from the lens of what I've learned about Bitcoin because Bitcoin it took me so long to understand Bitcoin. Um the fact that there is this consciousness emerging from uh, and this set of values emerging from simply code and the interaction of humans with that code, to me, that absolutely, I, I find that utterly fascinating. Me too. Um, so when I started looking at, at Noster, I, I had in the back of my mind, I, I, I've al I always have this uh, sense of wonder with, with Bitcoin. And I started feeling the same kind of sensation with, with Nostr, the most, uh, the more I interacted with it and the more I read the specifications of the protocol, um, I, I started getting this, the same sense, uh, from, from Nostr. And now I, I think that my, my thinking with regards to freedom has changed into thinking that Bitcoin is one side of the freedom whatever, pentagon, hexagon, triangle, whatever it might be. But it's just one of the sides. And I think Noster is a tool, in the same way that Bitcoin is a tool, is a tool that takes care of another side. I, I don't know what other sides there are to this shape uh, that is freedom, but I 100% think that Noster is... Um, is this incredibly, incredibly liberating tool for freedom? Um, in, in a way, I I think it might be more important than 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 Bitcoin. Um, at the same time, I think that Noster would never had happened without Bitcoin and without the Lightning Network. Right. Um, it, it's not a technical requirement. It's not like a layer three or like these people like to think in terms of like these layers and, you know, uh, lighting is the layer two and, and Nostr could be the layer three. Uh, it, technically, it's, it's not whatsoever. But from an economical sense, 
there are layers to things. There are things that require other things, mm -hmm. not technically, but economically. And in order to have a network, uh, if you can call Nostr a network uh, or an, ecosy an ecosystem, in order to have Nostr, you need to have infrastructure that runs Nostr. You need to have the relays. You need to have the developers. You need to have all these things, right? Um, and if those things are funded by PayPal or by bank wires or by anything that is not completely censorship resistant, then those things inherit, like you cannot have a layer on an economic layer on top of something else that has more freedom than the lower layer. The la lower layer, in the upper layers inherit right. the freedom and the censorship resistance on all these attributes from the lower layers. So I see Nostr as a as a as an economic layer running on top of Bitcoin because of the fact that we can pay for relays, we can send money to Snowden like we did when he came into into Nostr. Uh, we can do these things, and there is no choke point. There is no one place where who, who the U.S. government or whoever it might be can go and say. We need to shut this down. We need to shut down this relay because there is this communication that we don't like. There is none of that. Whereas if you pay for a hosting machine in AWS, they can go to AW, they can go to Amazon and say, we need to shut down this computer because we don't like which is what happened to, to Gap, to Gap, uh, right? I think it was Gap or one of these censorship resistant sites uh, mm -hmm. that <laughs> was shut down. Um, these things need to be funded with censorship resistant money. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I'm, Nostr to me absolutely captivated my, my, uh, my imagination, the sense of wonder that I, that I feel with everything that's possible. It's, it's off the charts. Um, and I keep interacting with developers that are feeling the same way. We're, look, we're seeing the amount of opportunity of things that we can build. Like we can actually build what the internet was supposed to be supposed to be or at least the web was supposed to be since the 70s uh we can actually build it now in a much much better way than what they had in mind and to me the amount of <laughs> the, the the impact and the freedom that that can bring to to the people that choose to interact with it is uh it's absolutely staggering can you before we continue that, because there's a bunch of stuff I want to touch on, but can you just kind of explain to people what the basic architect, why this architecture is different and why it permits that degree of freedom? And not, you don't even have to kind of explain why the integration with Bitcoin is so important, but just what is its general, like, why is it so different than the web as it exists today? Why does it allow for so much more freedom? The thing is that um, uh, what what Nostr does, there, the way compute, uh, network compu networking has been done for the most part for the past few decades has been there's many clients and there is one server. The server can be multiple computers, but at the end of the day is this one central point where we all coalesce. That central point is the authority that gives you the truth. Um, so you go to twitter.com and you get a list of whatever tweets from your your the people that you follow and you trust that these people have said have written these things because twitter.com is telling you that they wrote these things there is no second check there is no point where are you saying well, well let me dig into this no 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 if it comes from twitter.com that's it that's the truth um then in, in 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 networking, we have peer to peer connections, which is what um, slash tags ha has been doing. I mean, uh, BitTorrent, for example, uh, it's it's kind of the same, where you connect to multiple people um, to get some kind of state, right? So I can publish tweets, and you can connect to me directly, and I can give you this information of what I wrote, and then you connect to someone else, and you make all these connections. Uh, I'm, I'm dumbing it down, like I'm simplifying because explaining this properly would <laughs> take a long time. Mm -hmm. But broadly, it's, it's like this. We have like these two different paradigms. The the peer-to-peer -peer one is really, really hard. Um, it's how Lightning Network works. Um, and we, we see what running a Lightning Network node 
implies it's it's really hard. You need to be your your uptime needs to be pretty much twenty four seven. Um, it's 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 very 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 complex. It's not something that, at least for the moment, it's not something that absolutely every single person can do with a click of a button. Uh, especially people that are not interested in in doing it. They just want to interact interact with the Lightning Network. Um, so Noster the the Noster brings a design that. It keeps the idea of these central focal points, but it removes the authority from them. So the authority is pushed completely to the edges. And because everything you do on Noster is signed with private keys, in the same way you transact with, with Bitcoin, in the same way, the, um, the validity, the authenticity of the data is kept within the data itself. It's just the signatures. So then the idea that you have these central points becomes kind of irrelevant because you can have as many of these central points as you want, right? So you can have what's called a relay. You can have a relay that is under US law uh, that might censor uh, whatever someone from Iran might say. But then you can have this other relay in Iran, and they, the only thing they can do is not give you data. Like you can ask them for what did John say? And maybe they, they lie and they tell me, well, he didn't say anything. But because I can ask as many relays as I want and I can just ask your relay. So say if every single relay bans you, I can just go to your relay and ask you, what did you say? And I get the data immediately. Um, so the beautiful thing is, and, and uh, NVK, he used to run the Bitcoin Hackers Mastodon instance and and there was you know some people using it but at some point uh he decided that he didn't want to pursue running this thing anymore um and he was also running because he was also running brb which is a a, a noster relay at the same kind of at the same time he shut down both of the servers that he was running the people that were using bitcoin hackers went to Twitter and started complaining. Right. Why did you do this? You took all my data. You took my blah, 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 blah. <laughs> the people that were using Noster, most people didn't even realize that it had happened because mm. your experience of using Noster did not change. Like you needed to go to the settings and go to your list of relays and see a red dot <laughs> next to the relay and say, oh, what's going on here? But you did not even realize in the same way that when China banned the Bitcoin miners, the Bitcoin network didn't care. Like, okay, blocks were coming in a little bit slower, but no one said, oh no, you took my transaction. <laughs> there was no bitching on, 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 on Twitter because, because China had taken transactions that you wanted to do. Like transactions were still there. They all confirmed. Like it's, it's no one... If, if you weren't paying attention, you didn't know that this massively impactful uh, thing had happened to the Bitcoin network. People didn't even realize, mm -hmm. which, is, <laughs> which is what happens when you, when you move these, these things to, to the edges. So, you know, basically your identity is a key pair. You have all these different relays that when I sign a note gets blasted out and 95% of them might be like, don't like John, not, not transmitting his, his note. But, you know, one in Zimbabwe who's not sensorial at all might be like, yeah, I'll do that. And so it gets sent out. And so people that are following me, they can see I signed the message. It was relayed. They get to see it. And that's communication, right? Um, so one question is presumably a system like, I mean, it's way more... Uh, heavy, I, you know, data heavy, because the same in a centralized server, like one entity sends out the information, whereas in this one, several relays may be relaying the information. And so it's like, it's presumably more less data efficient. Um, is like one, is that the case? And what's the kind of implications of that? And two, this seems like a very simple architecture once it's been built, you know, which is often the case with innovation. You look back and you're like, why, why, why didn't anyone think of this before? But why didn't anyone think of this before? Like, what is the major like light bulb moment here? Why did it emerge now? Was it just because Bitcoin kind of came before and had a similar sort of model and someone's in Fiat Jeff perhaps thought like, 
well, maybe we can apply this to communications. Like, well, why not earlier? I'm not sure why not, why yeah. not early. Yeah. So the, the first question, yes, for sure. That it's definitely that way. The, um, the, the, there is an impact on the, on the data, uh, a large impact on the data. So say, for example, you go to twitter.com and twitter.com give you all, gives you all the tweets. If you connect to 20 different twitter.com quote unquote, um, you'll get 20 times the, the amount of data. Um, and there's a lot of things that we can do to improve this. Um, and, and that's, what's beautiful because it's all open protocol, open networks, um, and, and open source code. We can, we can experiment with a bunch of different, uh, solutions to, to this problem, which I don't think it's going to be a problem at all. Um, and yes, like now, if you use, um, Noster on the go on your phone using data, it's going to really, really consume a lot of data. Um, but when I was in Thailand at the beginning of the year and the data that I had was super expensive. So within one day, I wrote a proxy, which instead of connecting to a bunch of relays, I just connected to my server at home and my home server at home created all these connections. So from a data consumption perspective, my client was using the same amount of data as a Twitter client would use. So like one time like every event was sent to my phone one time and there's a lot of things that that can be done with this i um in fact you could you could pose that with fedi you could have proxies or caching services that are run within the fedi instances which means that you can have a community that is already using has some kind of um trust uh, in this in this localized place, they can trust the um, the the consumption of these communications to this um, to to this Fedi instance. So there's a lot of things that can be done. Uh, so I am 100% convinced that this is not uh, a significant problem at all. For not a for scaling Justin. issue long term. It's not a scaling issue. Uh, the thing is that it, it, it's funny because. I think Noster scales so much better than most things. <laughs> but Noster at this point is so misunderstood that the things that Noster is absolutely fantastic at, but simply they have not been built yet. People are saying, oh, this is going to kill Noster. This is a big problem for us. So for example, discoverability. Discoverability is a... Right now, everybody's talking about how bad discoverability is in Noster. What discoverability? A... How? Like, oh, yes. What? The, so, so at the moment, it's mainly discovering people that you want to interact with. Right. Like um, follow suggestions. In, yeah. Follow in Twitter. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there has been very, very little attention paid to the onboarding experience to, to Noster. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why most onboarding experiences to Noster, they are, are absolutely horrible at the moment, which means you get a large ch churn of new users and it's fine. You know, like right now using Noster requires some kind of um, investment or, you know, not obviously economical investment, but, you know, um, energy investment uh, and money share investment. But, but there are, there are, all these are problems that are not only going to be solved, but they're going, going to be solved in ways that the centralized platform simply cannot do. They cannot, they will not be able to, discoverability is going to be so much better in Noster than on the rest of the internet that <laughs> the fact that today in 2023 people were complaining about discoverability issues in Noster is going to be laughable. Um, and and the same thing for, for relays. The thing is that when you push signatures to the edges and validation of the signatures to the edges, to the actual clients, then there is no... DevOps team that you need to hire because you need to have a thousand servers like Twitter might be running. These things organically, they can spread out because it scales at the protocol level, it scales horizontally. You don't need to have a Twitter or a Facebook kind of team working on keeping these services alive. Whereas Google and, and all the fans, they need to invest in being able to keep these services alive. What I find really interesting 
and this is kind of speaking to the, the Bitcoin element of it, is because of the increasingly seamless integration with Lightning, you know, and I'm sure that will get much better in a very short period of time. But now all these things like so-called problems that emerge, like, you know, something we would want this to do, something we want to be developed, a data issue, uh, whatever. Now, immediately, a financial incentive can just will just kind of shift to it. It's like, oh, this is something that we need done, but who's, you know, how can it be done because it's going to be costly or or whatever? The market will just be like, well, it, it turns out this problem is worth 10 sats to every user who like is facing the problem or 100 sats. You know what I mean? Like be, because it's so integrated, it just seems to be the case. Like whenever, when you have that element of freedom and this integration with you know, censorship resistant money and, you know, the, the way in which it can flow, it just seems like, oh, like when something is encountered, it'll be priced right away. And maybe it'll be priced out. Be like, you know what, that problem, people aren't willing to pay to solve it. But this problem, people are willing to pay X amount to solve it. Like every problem now has a price and it can be, that price can be paid like that. And what does that mean for the pace of development, the type of solutions that get developed? Like, it's just, it's mind blowing, isn't it? It, it, it really is. And uh, I think we're barely experimenting. We barely started experimenting with these things. Uh, the fact is that in protocol payments, uh, so payments within Nostr, as Nostr native events, um, started happening, I think, maybe less than three months ago. Um, the fact that, and Currently, there is, I know of one client, Amethyst, the, the client that for like the main client for Android, that is doing a lot of this work where they post bounties for, for features or like someone posts a bounty for, for some kind of functionality and they choose what to implement based on what's highest bid. Like what's, what's the, uh, the largest pool of money? Because uh, that is basically you voting with your money uh, for something that you really, really want instead of having to conduct all these user surveys um, to try to assess what the market wants. You can just get the market to pay for those things. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of experimentation in, in this realm. Um, I And actually, <laughs> when uh, back in January, I, I was thinking, I was constantly thinking about Noster um, and I wrote an... I wrote like a like a blog post uh, for for the issue of creating marketplaces, localized marketplaces, because you always have the issue of um, how to how do you create a market, right? When when you don't have a market, there are no buyers, there are no sellers, and you have the chicken and egg problem of why would a market why would a seller come to a market if there are no buyers and vice versa. And just thinking around Noster, because uh, again, I was I was in Thailand at the time, and the the Uber like application in in Thailand was absolutely terrible, um, and there was just simply a mismatch of of communication between the the driver and and the and the rider, and, and Noster is you know is for communications, and I was thinking, well, if I could pay these people in 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 Bitcoin, I. Like you could create a localized market by posting to a multi-sig, like a two of two. If you had like a Fedi kind of system, uh, you can post to a two of two multi-sig and you can say, well, I'm willing to spend in the next one year, one Bitcoin, um, or maybe, yeah, maybe one Bitcoin is a lot, uh, half a Bitcoin in going to restaurants, right? And maybe you are willing to spend also half a Bitcoin in the same place. And we can post that money to uh, to a multi-sig. And when you want to orange peel a restaurant, instead of saying, hey, can I like pay in Bitcoin <laughs> and going that look route? Look at all this Bitcoin say, waiting for you. Look at all this Bitcoin waiting for you. Like right. if you start taking it <laughs> and you could be an oster, you could pay from the multi-sig over lightning. Like you could pay, uh, you could just go to the restaurant and you could pay from the money that you locked for this one use case. Um, and then there is so many different use cases of, of 
merging the fact that we have empirical payments with um, with having Noster. Um, in terms of the development, there is, I, I don't know if you know about him, but um, she's Sovereignty. He's the guy that runs the Nostrovia podcast. And he he's working on a super, super, super cool galaxy brain project called Nos Rocket. And the whole premise of Nos Rocket is... <laughs> The, the mission of Nost Rocket is humans are not living to their fullest potential. And the way that the approach that he has is that's the problem to be solved. And from that problem, you create a bunch of sub problems all the way down to we need to fix <laughs> this one button that doesn't work well in this application. Maybe it's all the way down in, you know, like, to a hierarchy of 25 items in a tree. Um, but people can say, I agree that this is a problem that I care about this much, and they can right. start funding these problems, right? So the idea is to break any kind of problem down to uh, works of six hour chunks. And then someone can say, I'm willing to do this work. And, and then there is, yeah, it's, it's a really complex system. There's already a bounty uh, on it. And so people can just pick up the work, solve the problem. Exactly. So the, the, the idea that he has in mind is to replace companies, to replace or get like this type of um, top down. Right. Um, yeah. So top, an top, organic top, prioritization of the tasks that need to be done based on an overarching like ma major goal and an immediate or an emergent pricing of those different tasks, that, which helps the prioritization and enables them to be solved. All the way down, all the way down. So you start from this really, you know, like humanity needs to go to Mars, whatever. Right, right. <laughs> and you can go to what kind of uh, what kind of screw should we put on this on the spaceship, right? And then you pay someone to work to work on that on figuring out what's the right screw. <laughs> that is pretty galaxy brain, yeah. Big. It is super <laughs> galaxy brain, project. yeah. <laughs> but you know, it is super ambitious. But he's thing... been working. So, and and the thing that's what's super cool is that he's been working on this problem for ten years. So, oh, and it's only that Noster came along that really he worked on this on this it. same problem before within Ethereum. Before, uh, I don't know if this is public. Well, he told me. Well, whatever. <laughs> now it is. <laughs> <laughs> he worked on this problem with uh, Vitalik before the. Um, the um, what was it called the, uh, the 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 fork that they had the hard fork that they did, um, okay whatever you, you know what I mean. What the, when recently when Ethereum Classic no 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 when Ethereum oh, the Classic DAO was born. hack is that was that the DAO hack time? thank you yeah, yeah yeah the DAO hack so before that then he went to Cardano to work on on, on fixing these issues same thing and he was saying okay this is all shit coining and this is all bullshit <laughs> so now then he saw Noster. And he said, oh, actually, I think this is the, the, the vehicle to execute on this vision. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very hopeful that Nodes Rocket will, will launch. Uh, you know, it's so buddies. fascinating about something like that. And I mean, there's, it's kind of a reflection of how consciousness works uh, in a sense. But because, you know, one thinks, and this is kind of this problem uh, has been getting discussed in the AI concern circles as well, right? Because it's like, well, what do you optimize for? What what do you have the super intelligence? What do you have the emergent market structure to optimize for? Like you said, he's want to optimize for human flourishing broadly. Now, even if we could come to some agreement on what that actually means, it still begs a question like, should you be optimizing for that, right? And should the AI be optimizing for human flourishing, human convenience, truth, love, paper clips? Like who knows? It's highly consequential on those, like there's a highly consequential decision. But what's interesting about the, you know, the approach that you just uh, explained is that what what's being optimized for will become clearer and clearer as the smaller priorities become priced and solved, right? Because you may think we're optimizing for this, and therefore, like a tree, a higher prioritization tree just fall, drops down from that and and gets built up, but your assumption, it's almost like you're able to correct your false assumptions 
as it goes, right? Because you may have all these menial tasks and one you thought was priced at X ends up being priced and prioritized at Y and that gets done. And that's, that somehow shifts the, the value tree even more, like tweaks it a little bit so that it's going in a better direction. And you do that, you know, all the way up over a course of whatever period of time. And presumably it allows the truth of what quote unquote should be optimized to kind of emerge. You know, so it's again, it's this bottom up rather than top down, uh, yeah, approach to to yeah, approach. solving yeah. whatever our problems actually are. Because what the fuck do we know? We think we know what our problems are, but maybe we don't. You know, and and this is a a way of allowing wisdom to emerge through our costly decisions, basically. That's yeah, that's the whole idea. And I think what he's what he's getting at uh, is that when you do this work within the realm of a, of a corporation, you you actually lack this uh, connection to reality, right? Because right. the work, say, with within IBM, for example, a bunch of employees, maybe the work that a thousands, literally thousands of people might be working on is misaligned with the real requirements of reality, right. but they don't know it yet. Like they don't, they will not know it for a really long time. There's so much latency. Right. They don't, they don't get that feedback in near as quick but, as you, as you might be in this sort of approach. Exactly. And with this system, you, you get like the immediacy of, of the feedback loops constantly, constantly you get, you get these feedback loops and maybe you'll get to solve one task, which uh, someone else that cares about a different part of the tree realizes that actually that task solves what you were working on uh, in, in a different way. And now like this whole chunk of the tree can be just chopped off. So interesting. You know, really it's, it's an emergent market-based incentive imbued way of like, determining what are the real issues, right? Like, let's say this architecture is already in place. How much time, energy, and uh, financial resources would be devoted to so-called solving climate change versus developing the capacity and ability for human beings to, to express themselves how they see fit and to transact, you know, with whomever and however they want? Like, what do you think would be the you know, the balance there. And again, I don't know. I mean, obviously I'm, I'm being a little tongue in cheek because I think the former has been over overly emphasized and the latter, not nearly as much, but that would be a, a manner for the truth to emerge, uh, you know, because what is truth even, you know, it's like, it's pretty nebulous concept in a lot of cases. And this would be a way to, because the, the, the as is so often said, talk is cheap, right? So that that's why mm -hmm having a cost to things is so consequential. That's why action is so consequential because there's a cost to action. And so when, when that can be so much more, uh, like when, when that, when it can be determined, when those, when the, the costs and the values imbued in those actions can be expressed with so much less latency and can be directed so much more easily or, or without friction, you really, I, th I think that is as good a mechanism as I can think of for emergent truth to emerge, to, to, to emerge because it, it has the element of both the choice, but, but also the cost, right? Because absent the cost, like the expression of a preference is relatively meaningless. So, you know, it's I, I need something that is, that is very common because I, I, I've worked on, on large organizations and the amount of waste of human right. time waste, which is, right. It's 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 a genocide if you think about it. The amount of man hours that are man hours completely wasted, yeah. wasted, it is an absolute genocide, and and it's just because of how separate those environments are from reality. There 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 is nothing going from from transcending or connecting those those two those two environments, um, and it's a, it's a, it's an absolute tragedy. The I, and I think it kind of kills the human spirit because I think in a way people sense that they Absolutely. are doing meaningless jobs, mm -hmm. uh, meaningless work. And I think that I've, I've worked with a lot of people that realized that they were having that kind of uh, job. And I, I think it it translates into seeing the world as, um, as a very scarce, in terms of opportunities, uh, 
as a very scarce place, as a very frightening place. So you end up, you end up think, thinking that you have that job. You know that it's meaningless. You know that it's the, the work that you're doing doesn't matter, but they are thankful because they think there's nothing better. There's right. no other opportunity. And it's, a, it's an absolute tragedy. And that, you know, being in that circumstance causes you to like twist and distort your own mind to fit it. So it's less disruptive to, to, to you. Right. So like, because such a circumstance would, you know, cause a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress, a lot of tension, a lot of despair, a lot of all these things, you know, you hear the term all the time that someone, people, you know, say that their jobs are soul sucking or soul destroying, right? Like, what, isn't that like horrible that, that you're, 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 you're doing something that is so antithetical or counter to what you want to be doing, how you want to be feeling, what you deem meaningful, that that's how you characterize it. And so I think part of the reason that there's, you know, part of the contributing influence to social decay and degradation that we always rail on in, in Bitcoin land is this people have to contort themselves to fit this uh, unnatural or or imperfect sort of landscape of meaning for themselves. And they do that through substance abuse and medication and diseases of despair and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, so I'm, I'm totally on board. Like if we can correct that, if those, if the, if, if what we collectively or individually and emergently collectively work on can graft more with a greater fidelity on what is actually most true and most meaningful and good and beautiful and all that kind of stuff, then it seems obvious that it's going to correct a lot of those, you know, contortions and distorted perspectives that people have that are causing them so much pain and anguish, broadly speaking, you know, so again, you know, Bitcoin kind of fixes this, but I guess now it's Bitcoin <laughs> and Noster fixes this. <laughs> yeah, but may, maybe in the end, it's actually freedom fixes this. <laughs> right. Well, of course. Yeah. But it's, you know, the, the it, thing is, the, the thing is that, that, that I, one of the, one of the issues is that these kind of uh, problems are, are downstream from the fact that we have these massively big uh, organizations, whether it is governments or incredibly large companies, um, that you get the opportunity of live in this isolated world where you don't have to have a direct contact with reality. So that ties what we were talking uh, at the beginning about, about Argentina and these people who had never in their lives and their parents' lives and their grandparents' lives, they had never had a, a job doing something. Um, because there was an organization supporting them, the government. There was an, an organization that was big enough and extracting enough of value somewhere else that they could sustain this life. But without that, that organization, a person that just sits at home watching TV all day will perish because they will not have the means to sustain their life. Um, and in the same way, you tie with the people that are doing menial jobs at companies that there is so much noise that thousands of people working on something that is completely irrelevant goes un un unnoticed. Because if you have a company of 10 people and the work that eight of those people are doing doesn't matter, that company goes bankrupt. In a company with 100,000 people, if 1,000 people are doing something that is completely irrelevant, probably no one will even notice, right? Mm. So the, the, the size of this organization is what's bringing this uh, capacity of being abstracted from reality. And I actually think that that's one of the things that in different ways, Bitcoin and Nostr fix. Um, because the way I've been thinking, you already, you are... Like you understand Bitcoin so well that the the why Bitcoin fixes that part is it doesn't need to be discussed, but why Nostr fixes this part or how Nostr affects this part, I think is a little bit novel and less understood. So the way I, I think about that is anytime you create a new company, a new project, or whatever, the one of the hardest part that you need to address is how are you going to get customers? How are you going to get users, right? 
So discoverability. Anytime you have a, a Facebook or a Twitter or a YouTube or any of these kind of companies who have uh, such a large network effect, the, the amount of value that they can extract from this network effect is so large, is so vast that they have not a, not a monopoly position, but close to what we could conceptually think of as a monopoly position. It doesn't matter if they are providing the best platform or the best applications. It, it simply, you can launch, launch a Twitter that is 2x better than Twitter and no one will care. Right, because your friends are in Twitter, same thing with Facebook, with WhatsApp, like all these things, they have so much inertia that it's really, really, really hard to, to compete with these things. And the amount of value that is created when you create a network effect, like the one that Facebook has, it's immense. But that network effect was not created by, by Facebook. That network effect is part of human behavior. It just happens that Facebook was at the right place at the right time to capture the entire thing. And they give a bit of value back to the users enough to make it worth their while. But that's why Facebook and these companies, they have such lavish uh, market capitalizations because the value of their market capitalization of Facebook is not the Facebook code or the Facebook company or their, or their IP. It's just the network effect is for the most like 90% is the network effect that they have within their silo. And you cannot take that network effect somewhere else. So when you create a company, you think, well, I need to put advertisements on Google because that's, if I want to be uh, discoverable in any way, I need to be on Google and to be on Facebook. So you are literally paying a tax. <laughs> Maybe you don't want to pay the tax, but if you want to be able to compete, you need to pay this tax to these, these, uh, these companies. And what, what Nostr has, which is what has captivated, uh, captured my, my attention so much, is that Nostr, because data cannot be siloed, cannot be, okay, it's facebook.com or it's twitter.com. Data transcends any kind of silo. Uh, the network effects of anything that happens in Noster benefit the whole ecosystem of Noster. The thing is that when you put the current experience of using Noster against the experience of using Twitter, it depends on who you are but 98% of the population or probably 99.9% .9 of the population are going to say, well, Twitter is so much better because my friends are there. Facebook is better than mm -hmm. Nostra because my friends are there. Um, so it's a really hard pitch, especially when you go to people and you say, well, uh, censorship resistance, I, I think that's a horrible, horrible pitch because no one cares mm -hmm. about censorship resistance. No one is getting banned. No one getting shadow banned. It's the uh, sliver of the population that cares about these things. Uh, um, uh, Edward, Edward Snowden did the revelations. Everybody's still using <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> no one cares. Um, but when you think that Nostr has so many different, wildly different applications, which each one of them might have its own network effects, the fact that each network effect, so for example, I wrote Substr, which is like a Spotify type of client where you can publish your music, you can get paid, you can create playlists. So if you create a cool playlist, uh, you will get paid every time someone is listening to that playlist. And then the artists are getting paid as well, et cetera. And then I wrote highlighter.com, which is kind of a similar idea where you can, it's like when you can use medium.com, readwise, and you can capture the stuff that you're reading that you find valuable and you can keep it there. You can keep it on highlighter.com. But the fact that they are not uh, a silo, the fact that they is, everything is happening on Noster, any kind of network effect that Substar might get or that highlighter might, might create it will feed back into the whole ecosystem, right? So maybe people will come to Noster because of knowledge management tools that are cross-compatible with your music player. 
or maybe someone will come because there is a market that sells this art that they like, you know, uh, like painting from Maddox, for example. Um, and you will start using Nostra because of these one pumping use case. And then you might start discovering the whole thing. Go back to the beginning of this, of this monologue is that the reason I see Noster killing the Facebook and these large institutions, these large, um, uh, these large companies is that within a Noster world, uh, you cannot create a multi-billion, you know, hundred billion uh, type of organization because you cannot uh keep the the users and the data hostage which is what every single company up till now has been doing you use evernote the value that you create is compatible with evernote you go to notion the work you've done in in evernote is dead <laughs> it's like, okay yes you can export whatever the value of the information is not on the data that you wrote it's on the links of the information right that's that's what idea is right idea is the connection of two different things um so you go to you transition to notion and the work that you've been doing in evernote has is done is, is dead you transition from notion to rom research your your value that you accrued within notion is dead um but because you know that if you leave Evernote, your data will die, your, the value of that data will die. There is a large incentive to not leave Evernote. There is an incentive for Evernote to say, well, we need to raise your prices. Well, we need to collect some data to give you some ads. Um, that kind of user abuse is not possible within Nostra because you, the, the companies within Nostra, they always have the gun to the head, like the miners in Bitcoin. They always have the gun to the head of, I can leave at any time at no pain to me. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally, totally agree. Um, and you know, it's interesting as you're, as you're saying that and relevant to our discussion earlier about how, a, you know, a protocol, so, you know, something you interact with on the internet can influence your psychology, your mindset, your perspective, how you act pretty much seemingly, you know, things that are very fundamental about you. And we were just discussing this, um, you know, how having to uh, come to grips with your situation ca causes you to contort yourself to fit that so that the tension of, of being there isn't too destabilizing. And you, you think about where we are today and your, your comments on, uh, you know, kind of the instinct for authority. You have political jurisdictions that you're nestled within, right? And you're basically a prisoner of that, tax you, hard to leave, all the rest of it that we all know. But everything downstream of that almost operates on the same model, as you're saying. So like what Twitter wants you to be is a Twitter prisoner, because that's how they can extract the most value from you. Perhaps slave is the better metaphor, whatever, but you get the point. And like Thank part you. of, and every everyone does that. And, and, and I think part of the cultural issues that we see emerging is kind of like, you know, everyone is Stockholm syndrome in so many different like places, like. You, you 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 almost get like Stockholm syndrome PTSD from Twitter and Facebook and Google and Evernote and all the things you interact with online and then your meat space institutions that you're subject to and the governance models that you're within and no wonder that causes like a like a weird distortion of your perspective because you're you're a prisoner on so many different levels and yes you 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 get some kind of value back and that's why you make that proverbial deal with the devil but you're still you're still locked in. And one of the initial things that just blew my mind about Nostra, I was like, okay, so we have an open protocol that anybody can contribute to. We have like, you know, native censorship resistant, frictionless payments basically built in or, or, you know, will be. And then you have a type of identity that can m move between like services, clients, apps seamlessly and not have any loss as a result of doing that. Be able to like bring what you've accrued to your identity with you wherever you go. And like the first thing, the first like epiphany to me was like, wow, that the how much is that going to accelerate development because competition is going to be so much more pure. It's like, okay, yeah, 
Damis is like awesome right now and I love it. But if another one is better, then I'll probably use that more. Or, you know, like you'll just be able to hop around. So, and of course that's less beneficial to your would-be uh, captors, but it's much better for you because you get to just make choices based on what is literally the best solution, irrespective of what you have to give up or lose as a result of making those changes. And so, you know, when, when that landed in my brain, I was like, wow, like how fast is this going to happen? And what are going to be the type and scale of solutions? But it also makes me think, you know, and this, this would be a question for you as a builder in the space. How, how does it influence the, you know, this sort of structure of things influence the economics and the incentives of building something in the space, you know, because you're not collecting all the sheep into a pen, all your prisoners, mm -hmm. and then saying to public markets, VCs, what have you, like, look what we can squeeze out of all these fuckers over the next 10 years, right? You're basically saying, is it just SATS flow business models? Like, hey, if people use our clients, you know, we take a cut of the payments that are happening through our, our client, and that's the business model. And we can't really... You know, I'm sure there'll be other ways to figure out monetization, but like we can't clump everyone together and sell you sell the future value of you to some entity and you know cash out in that way. You know that's that model seems to be basically turned on its head. So what do you think is will how how will economics be kind of influenced in in this new paradigm? Which which were before answering that, which what you're getting at has been the case for the past two decades. The past two decades has, has been about create something that gets millions and millions and millions of users. Don't worry about monetization. Don't ever charge anyone anything. Just get users. Just grow. Just hockey stick growth. Mm -hmm. and, and you'll find a way to abuse your users at some point. It doesn't right. matter. Sell like, that's absolutely secondary. <laughs> absolutely. Just mine their information. And like, who? no one cares about that part. Um, and but with regards to, to your question, the um, monetization. I, I, I obviously I've been thinking a lot about monetization, um, and the 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 thought that continuously pops to my mind is that Noster, the nature of Noster is still widely unknown. The, in the same way that Bitcoin in twenty eleven and twenty twelve, other than a couple of Illuminati that said, "Oh, this is going to disrupt central banks." Uh, it was, oh, censorship is in PayPal. Cool. You know, like it was very, 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 very easy to understand Bitcoin under uh, a level one thinking, right? Like you see it, oh, okay, so PayPal. But um, but if, if you started thinking about monetizing Bitcoin back back in 2011, you would uh, uh, um, probably arrive to, and that's what, what happened, you, you would arrive to wrong conclusions. And I think within Noster, it's kind of the same thing where, it's too early in the discovery phase of what Nostr is to think about monetization. And I speak, I speak with the founders of, of within Nostr and like builders and the people that are making things uh, <laughs> very, very regularly, uh, almost daily. I have like a one hour or two hour long call where I go for a walk with this other person and we just discuss all these things. And Whenever I, I talk to someone that is thinking, oh, maybe I should charge for this thing, I try to dissuade them from focusing too much on that. So for example, I, one founder uh, wanted to charge for user uploads uh, for pictures. And the, the fact is that no one's gonna pay for that because it's, 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 it's not, you cannot really have a business based on, on, on that. Uh, maybe someday. Probably not, but not at this point. And at this point, it's not going to affect your bottom line in any way. Like maybe you'll get, if it goes well, maybe you'll get like a hundred bucks a month. If it goes well, <laughs> which I, I, I don't think it, it would get anywhere near near that. Um, so the way I think is, A, I don't think within Nostra you can have what I was saying before. I don't think you can have uh you know, hundreds or hundreds of billions, like a Facebook level company. Mm -hmm. Maybe there is, uh, I think there is certain approaches that will yield uh, 
very nice business, a very, very successful uh, organization. But I don't think any, any Nostra company will get to that massive scale with you know, 10 or 20 or 30, 50,000 employees. Well, how could, I don't how think could they? Because if someone does something great, another one just be like, well, I'll copy that and add or subtract this and everyone can just go over seamlessly. So how could you Prec really precisely? I, 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 well, you can't, then that's the, that's the whole point. Right. But, but what I think is that that model is actually dead outside of Nostr as well. I think that model will not come back. Um, <laughs> and maybe interest rates going up is the, the final nail in the coffin. I mean, we, we've seen what, what all these growth uh, unicorn right. companies have been doing with their, their tech teams. Like they've slushed everybody. They've been firing people uh, <laughs> all over the place. And, and I think interest rates might come down, might, might come back down uh, just in time for Nostr to have shown what it is and destroy that model anyway. Um, but the fact is that right now Nostr is so small, it's minuscule, but it has compounding effects across everything that can be done on the internet. Whatever you can think that can be done on the internet, Nostr is probably better at doing it. And when you think that network effects multiply on all the use cases, the world that I see is a world where all these applications that we're used to using online will be Nostra clients, which means that if Facebook, at some point, is, if Facebook tries to compete head-to-head -head with the network effects of Nostr, Facebook, Facebook will get absolutely obliterated. Same thing for Twitter. I think Twitter will very, very likely end up or dead, or a Twitter or another client. I think that's where we're going. So these massively big companies with these massively capitalized companies, I think there is no space for them within Nostr or outside of Nostr. It's so interesting, man, because like it, it makes you think. Okay, well, what is going to make a user stay with a particular client? And it seems like the only answer is how good the experience is, right? Like, does it have the things that I want in the way that I want them? And the second that it doesn't, why would I stay? And, and isn't that beautiful? Isn't well, that where we want competition to happen? Right. <laughs> and just, that's the mind blowing thing. Like imagine how more, much more quickly the solutions in the market will cater to those preferences rather than, as we keep saying, like, you know, Twitter or Facebook or Instagram gets you sucked in with something. And then they're like, gotcha, bitch. And now you can't go anywhere. So there's like, they don't have to respond, you know, as much to, to your desires and stuff, but like in this, they don't have to respond at all to the, your desires. Like well, they could, sure, they can sure. shit on your face. Like they could not care less <laughs> about your desires. Like you have, if you have a hundred thousand followers on Twitter or a million followers on Twitter, they, like and, and that's your primary way of communicating with your audience. They own you. <laughs> yeah, they well, absolutely I mean, we, own you. In recent years, we've seen what happens to people that get kicked off of Twitter. It's like they are unpersoned. It's like, what happened to that person? Oh, they they were just kicked uh, off Twitter just, for like last two years. Oh, I you know, I thought they I were thought dead, he died. Basically, I didn't <laughs> I didn't even know they still existed. You know, which is so that's part of what makes well, that's part of the reason why there's an incentive and a need for something like Nostra because that's so scary that. You know, not not only just all the time you've put into you know getting your followers, let's say, but just that you can be so easily unpersoned. Like, oh, you said the wrong thing, counter regime, whatever the fuck, boom, you're gone. And right now, maybe there's a more benevolent dictator in charge in Elon, but you know how how long will that persist? You know, and will it? So, man, it's uh, it's so fascinating. I know. Are you tight on time? Do you have? A, I'm good. Do, yeah, I'm feeling good. More? Yeah. Um, what was I going to ask next? Oh, you know. In, just to finish the, the the point that I was making, or we were both making about the prisoner sort of dynamic, imagine what, you know, what really excites me is kind of like how people's minds work and how people are influenced by different ideas and ethics and values and principles and how they act them out and all that stuff. Uh, if we're operating under the assumption, and I think it's at least partially true that like this architecture that you find yourself within, the architecture of incentives and power and authority, 
influences how you think, the emotions that emerge within you, who you become, all that kind of stuff. And we're kind of making the case that the current architecture has a lot of negative attributes. What happens when you combine like what we, you know, what Bitcoin is? And I think we've both talked about like how Bitcoin influences your mind, changes behaviors, reassesses values, all that kind of stuff with, you know, combining it with this architecture, another freedom architecture that is Noster, isn't it exciting to consider the effect, the impact that that degree of freedom will have and what, what enables that freedom, what constitutes it, like all that goes into it will have on people's minds, you know, like in, in, to use an over, an overly used uh, term recently, but to like, to break free from the matrix, basically to like inculcate, you know, uh, a more open, a more free, a more clear mind ab uh, about life or, or reality generally. Like it's just, it's super exciting to think how these solutions that we just talked about, like a better, what's a better client for social media or for music or for video or for whatever. The fact that it can like, it's so, you're so free to choose and it's so capable at catering to your preferences. The marriage of those two things, like I just, I just think, are going to instill in people such a profound sense of agency, of freedom, of creativity, of, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I, I, I mean, I mean, I was al already on board for kind of Renaissance 2.0 as a result of Bitcoin. Right. And I think we, <laughs> we all kind of thought that something like this would emerge as a result of that. It's just really cool to see that it, it appears to be emerging now and that it has legs and there's enthusiasm around it. I mean, I guess one obvious question is just what are the risks or, you know, what are the, um, you know, in all this rosy talk about something like this, you know, what are the downsides, risks, flaws, all that kind of stuff? One of the things that I've observed um, recently is how quickly the conversation about um changes on the algorithm of Twitter or Google for, for that matter, because Google has been doing this for many, many, many years. Um, how quickly everybody's in sync with, oh, I'm seeing this a lot, or why is this on my feed? Um, and I wonder a lot what happens with the, um, the, the, these algorithms that everybody in some way, I mean, loosely speaking, everybody is in some ways plugged in into these algorithms. So if you think about it, there is, um, there is a, 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 the experience that we, every person that is, have their life around, the, around using the internet frequently, uh, which is most of us, our experience is very homogeneous. Um, because <laughs> you, you, you interact with, with the algorithm, the code of the algorithm is the same. It might be the experience that it, it yields. It might be uh, tailored in different ways to, to your, the data that it's mined from your behavior, but the, the, the code of the algorithm is the same. So we've been operating for the past 10 years or so under this uh, normalizing function across society. And it's a bit of an unknown what happens when you have global communications, because it used to not be the case that we had this normalization before the internet. We, we didn't all were affected by the same algorithm a uh, hundred years ago, right? From Japan to whatever, to Argentina. Um, so societies could be much more heterogeneous. But at the same time, we didn't have global communications, instant free global communications a hundred years ago. So I wonder, I, it's, a, it's an unknown, uh, but what happens when, when you get global communications, but you don't get a normalizing function over every single person that is plugged into the internet? Um, I, I, I don't know. I, th I think these things have so many uh, unknowns, unknowns, like I can feel the unknowns, unknowns. I can think of a few known unknowns. Um, like when you, when you think about the fact that the data that it, that inhabits Noster is completely liquid and th there is no container uh, separating this data, the, the amount of innovation that is downstream from the fact that you can grab the 
music um, listening behavior of all your followers, and you mesh that with the type of books that your followers are reading and commenting on and, and having conversations around. It used to be that you have Goodreads. It used to be that you have Spotify. Those were <laughs> separated. There was no way of having one person grabbing the data and interacting with the data, combining it in different shapes. It was completely impossible. Maybe you can get some kind of deal where Spotify and, and Goodreads share information and there is like a team of 50 engineers working on, but it, it, it was not, it, you could not do that spontaneously throughout every single different use case. And the amount of innovation that can occur from the fact that one person can grab all that information because it's public information as much as you as the person wants to make that information public. Um, you can grab all that information, mesh it in different ways and cut it and, and have such a, a pretty much an, an infinite amount of different combina combinations and ways to explore this data. Um, what, what happens when your experience of how you do the public square type of communication, the Noster, uh, the, the Twitter type of experience, what happens when you're interacting with that data in something that looks like a, like a 3D galaxy exploration game? There is one client that does display of notes instead of just like the typical feed. They, they do like stars and you can navigate to a galaxy and that galaxy is people that are talking about dance or about music, like hip hop, like French hip hop. And you go to that galaxy. But the person that you're interacting with, they are in the typical experience. <laughs> like it, it's the, the, uh, the, the level of how heterogeneous these experiences can be is absolutely massive, right? Um, but I, I, I don't know what's downstream from that. I don't know what's the side effects of doing these things. It might be terrible. <laughs> I don't well, think so, you, but it might you be. Know, you could characterize like, like the overarching shift, and I'm sure many have, is you because you keep saying like once information is unsiloed, you know, like obviously more and more of our lives are becoming digitized, right? It's becoming information. The value that we ascribe to things, the tools we use, Software's eating the world, right? It's been the trope for a long time. But in that, in a world where information, I mean, you can attempt to silo it, but what we're finding is you can't really, like there'll always be a way to unsilo information. You know, inf marginal cost of replicating information is basically zero, can be transmitted at the speed of light. Like what the, what are you ultimately going to do about that? And so, you know, the bigger question is what is the ultimate effect of, anything that's information based being completely unshackled basically and i mean we could get really cosmic with that and say well everything is ultimately information based like even meat space is information mm -hmm. and so <laughs> what happens when uh, when that is increasingly and increasingly unshackled like a very simple one that you know many people have opinions on in terms of the authority of the state but it's like ip right and and uh, trademarks and uh uh, patents and stuff like well that's just information you know and the ability to enforce the use of that information what happens when you just it's so easily available you you just can't the cost of enforcement is too high you cannot enforce that so what what happens then when information is so easily accessible and usable like well over the course of time that structure of stewarding and enforcing access to information will just go away because it's too too costly to enforce so then how does the how does the treatment of ip happen now presumably back to what we were saying about competition it'll just be subject to market forces like sorry that information is out there who's going to use it the best and yes you won't be able to ring fence it like we were talking about Twitter and Facebook and these companies that take that approach. So your proceeds from using a certain set of information will, pro will probably be less in the future, but them's the breaks, right? This, this freedom is coming for every, all information. So is Nostra just kind of another step in that inevitable progression towards liberating information? I, I think I think Nostra is the vehicle that makes 
the the fact that information yearns to be free, it it, it makes that effect um it, it makes it um compound on itself. Um because you can do all this cross linking of, of information and and you you can you can there, there is this concept that that um information back from from the the days of the creation of the web that content can can be addressable uh, you can have a url right you, and you link and you go from document a and document a is mentioning document b and there's there's a link so this this relationship and then this graph starts to to emerge and what Nostra gives you is that same type of graph across absolutely everything not just website abs absolutely everything um so I, I absolutely think, and so around 10-ish years ago, there was this concept of the semantic web, which which was a, a way of um, fixing uh, the, the issue that these siloed companies started started to get, where there was no, no, no way of getting uh, structured data of like an Amazon product, for example. You go to Amazon.com and you see this listing of whatever, uh, um, you know, uh, <laughs> whatever, uh, clothes. And th that the data that those were clothes, uh, you know, it's a pink shirt, for example, th that data uh, lived within, within uh, Amazon. So what companies that wanted to start using the data in some way they started scraping the data which is the the uh, the action of downloading the data in a pro programmable way and trying to infer pink shirt you know uh, so you try to get this data in ways that you can represent the data in different ways so a few yeah like 10 15 years ago the semantic web started where the idea was to Post the same website with the same information, but have the data that this is a pink shirt structured within the document in a way that the users don't see it. But if I download the HTML, the code of the website, I can see pink shirt. Um, and ultimately, the semantic web completely failed. Um, <laughs> I, I was kind of involved in creating things around the semantic web back, back in the day, but the effort made no sense because the person that has the data like Amazon.com has no benefit whatsoever of giving competitors <laughs> their their catalog, giving competitors the reviews, the descriptions, like all these different things. That's very, very valuable information for Amazon.com that keeps competitors at bay. Um, so there was an incentive for people to consume the data, but not in, uh, an incentive for people to create this structured data. Nostr by by default is structured. So you as the content, um, as the platform, if you will, that is producing these Amazon listings or these things, you are benefiting from the fact that there is this vast amount of data. So for example, um, a few weeks ago, there was this new application that came out that is um, like, a, it's called Webman. And it's a it's like a like a, a Walkman, but for for music, right? So they posted a bunch of songs that you could use interacting with that with uh, that application. Now I have Substar, so I could very easily integrate the data that they produced, and they can integrate the data that I that I produce. Now if we share the same uh, way of storing the data, we the the there is no integration; it just happens magically. Um, which is where, where things are moving. But the fact is that Webman benefited from Substar and Substar benefited from, from Webman. So we all we both have the incentive to share this data, to make this data addressable. Um, and, and, and the fact is that this, this, um, <laughs> this uh, again, this unsiloing of the data is... Um, beneficial for everybody that benefits, and it's detrimental for anyone that doesn't interact with the data in this way. There will be a point where Facebook and Twitter and, and Amazon, if they don't integrate with the Nostra data, they will just perish because there will be enough momentum of data in the network that will absolutely obliterate them. Yeah, I just, I think the consequences of 
information being liberated are just like you said they're kind of a lot of unknown unknowns there because it's information is is everything and if we're almost like the pace the 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 pace of liberating information at least relevant information to our lives is like growing exponentially what kind of impacts does that have and like you know what are the adjustments going to be for everything you know like as we said ethics and morals and everything before like just a simple example like let's say in a prior environment let's say with mu music or something like if you you have some sort of ip rights to music um and they can be enforced then the, the prevailing ethic might be like well then they should be like enforced it's fair for someone who creates music to benefit from their creation and like i I can totally see and probably agree with that argument. But if you find yourself in an environment like, well, it can't be enforced. So what's the ethic now? It's like, hmm. Like, I, well, I still think they should benefit somehow, but maybe not as much as they were imposing before. And this is kind of the mm -hmm. idea of how value for value might emerge. You know, a lot of people probably dismiss it now because like, well, why would I pay for something I can get for free? But I feel like it's going to kind of chew on people's, moral sensibilities a little bit more than they might be expecting because you'll be in a landscape well it's at your fingertips you can take it for free but would you walk into a store and like well bad example because it's physical but you know what i'm saying like would you do you not think the person that's giving you value deserves anything back you know sure you get to choose it's up to you what do you think but like that, that seems like where we're going and and that is definitely at least a, a you know an ethical shift of some kind, you know, because before yeah, yeah. The, the consideration was less. I, I, I think when, when you get top-down rules and you get accustomed to you living your life via obeying top-down rules, your moral compass gets completely obliterated because you don't have yeah. to develop one. Like you totally. just follow the rules. If mm -hmm. the rules are there, it, that's, that's morality. Morality equals rules. Yeah. And Perhaps the, the current global society that that we that we live in uh, has that moral compass way too <laughs> way way underdeveloped. Absolutely. But perhaps this information, this freedom of information, this yes, you can steal this. <laughs> uh, yes, you can reload on on these things. You you can have like the experience this tragedy of the commons. Uh, might change that if you see a song that you like and everybody does that song and no one is contributing back to the artist. Well, that song that you were enjoying will stop being produced. Um, but, but going back to the reality thing is, is, it's just, we are so abstracted from real world consequences, but we're just not used to these things. Mm. We're just not used to having consequences from our, from our actions. Yeah. We expect, that if we do something dumb, if we are not careful, we can sue the government because we tripped on the sidewalk. That's absolutely ridiculous. Like, pay attention. <laughs> it's so basic. Fucking pay attention. Um, but and 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 when you get in that in and, and that's where we find ourselves, right? When when your when you lack the uh, the development of a moral compass, then the moral compass becomes the law and then you're subject of becoming a, a pawn for tyranny when a tyrant is the one enforcing and, the, and uh, establishing the, establishing the uh, the laws there's um i, I read this uh, a few years ago but there was um i'm sure you you've read this uh, on the duty of civil disobedience uh, henry thoreau and and he was going on on it's an absolute super short read very 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 much recommended and one of the things that he was saying is that the the person he he the, the book to pretty much talks about this and the person that confuses the the morality with with rules uh it that's the most dangerous person that's the person that will do whatever is being told to do out of fear yeah. and and out of having no 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 moral compass and that's where we where we are right like we are in a place where nobody has to develop any kind of ethics or <laughs> even even talking to about these things is weird yeah <laughs> and and 
even if they had them, although you could make the case that to truly have them, these two things are have to go hand in hand. But even if you recognize them in some degree, the courage to espouse them or to stand like to stay true to them is also totally lacking. I mean, we, we the best example is obviously COVID, the, the COVID Corona. years. I mean, yeah. it's like, it's just insane how many people fall into the very, you know, circumstance that you just articulated. Like it's, it's perfect. And it's terrifying because it was most people, you know, and thank God or whatever for those courageous principled people that resisted that and didn't, you know, didn't fall into that and stayed true to their own principles and their own decision-making and on all that kind of stuff, because, you know, perhaps that was consequential in, in how far things went, you know, if, if, if more, if, if, if everyone, instead of 80% of people had, were so subject to that kind of, uh, mental perversion that, you know, that you just described, uh, maybe that form of tyranny. And again, like when I, I hate to use that term because people think it's just like, it's, it's always top down, but obviously this is a relationship, you know, you, people hunger for it in a certain sense, as we've been exploring in this conversation. And so, you know, if that was more, maybe, maybe that thing would have spiraled even more out of control. And, uh, and obviously we're not out of the weeds yet. I mean, there's still a lot of, you know, uh, aspects of that, that are bubbling beneath the surface and above the surface. And everyone has to be vigilant about the thing that I, you know, would talk about with family members and friends the whole time is this very notion. It's like, what do you believe is right or wrong? What is your ethical grounding? What are your values and principles? Where basically, where is the line in the sand? And then when it's met, what are you going to do? Because it's not your line in the sand. If you're just going to re be pushed back and redraw it, then it's not. And most people are very uncomfortable and unwilling to admit they don't have a line in the sand. It's not there. They will be pushed well, I, off I the think... edge of the cliff behind them if necessary, because what it takes to draw that line, they're not willing to, to pay that price, basically. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's a it's, um, it's side effect of the fact that we have the... Um, this notion of, of the truth is somewhere in between, right? Like everything needs to be met with, it's not at the extreme. It's not, it's, it's not as bad as you're saying, right? So because you have this moral flexibility, um, you, are, you, you will never be able to pin down a person and, and tell them, like you're saying, where is the, sun, the, the line in the sand? Because the way most people see it, the line of the sand should be redrawn constantly because, I mean, this is praxeology, right? <laughs> people don't want to act from, from first principles. Be people want to just simply react to the circumstances of the day. And I do wonder how much of this is driven by the algorithms and the algorithms tell, telling people, because we've seen how quickly with Corona, uh, opinions changed it it was within a matter of days it went from no one cares this is nothing don't panic to we're all gonna die we all need to get 16 vaccines in the eyes right um it went extremely extremely quickly and it's a it's a a beautiful beautiful showcase of how effective these what we were discussing earlier about the homo homogeneous um society global society this this layer of normalization across every single person that is imposed uh with a click of a button um and that's so scary mm -hmm. so I, I i do wonder in an other world where there is no there is no algorithm that is dictating uh the way you relate to information to 99 percent of the human population can uh can a, a, a corona effect happen? Can a shift of point of view, a normalization of point of views happen in, the, in, this, in this way? I truly think that it can't. Yeah, you may be right. And I, I, it also makes me think like, well, maybe a more natural so-called algorithm is able to emerge through that space, you know, and then we get into the, the God discussion, which we don't have time for today. But, you know, like what... What is that thing that's coming through as an ethic when the landscape is so flattened and open to 
and and lacking that manipulation of today's algorithms like wh what kind of emergent ethic actually comes through and where does that come from you know it's a super juicy question but just last point on on the on what we've been saying here is i think part of it is that for so many people self preservation self preservation as a minimum and self aggrandizement and all that kind of stuff as a as a maximum but self preservation trumps everything and that's part of the problem i think and i think that's why you know, we talked about meditation before and all these various perspectives you can have practices you can engage in that allow you to separate from ego to a degree again not to not to kill it not to disregard it but to to be the master of it rather than be the servant of it. I think that's part of the reason why those things have been so important for all of history is because if self-preservation is your primary goal, then you will be led down the road to servitude. You will be mm -hmm. able to be convinced of anything because as long as you don't like get, as long as you don't kill me, then like, I'll do what you say versus, you know, you, we look back on history and we look at heroes and martyrs and philosophers and warriors and stuff. And in hindsight, we glorify them because they were ones that said the primary thing is not self-preservation. It's adherence to some eternal or fundamental value or principle. Maybe it's love. Maybe it's truth. Maybe it's freedom. Maybe it's whatever. Those are some of the big ones, obviously. But to say, I'll lay down my life for the preservation and for my adherence to this principle, because that is actually, that act is more important than just my meat sack persisting for a few more years into the future. And, you know, obviously in the world today, the value of, of that and the appreciation for that seems to be in decline. And I'm very excited and hopeful that the tools that are emerging at our disposal and, you know, frankly, people like you and I and all the other people that are willing to explore these ideas and that there's interest in them it are actually happening more and more, I think makes me extremely optimistic, even against the backdrop of the last two years and all the power structures and institutions that were still ultimately nestled within. But it's like, it's so encouraging that it seems like the momentum is gathering for, you know, these tools and these discussions and these ways of reconstituting your behavior and you know what what could be the cause of greater hope than that i, I mean i couldn't couldn't say couldn't agree more with what you're saying and I, I am ridiculously optimistic with where we're going and the, the fact is that in in a sense is 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 kind of relieving the experience of of discovering bitcoin where you realize that you do not need to wait for hyper Bitcoinization to enjoy the benefits of using Bitcoin. Mm. You don't have to wait for to be, go to every single coffee shop and pay with Bitcoin. Like that, 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 that doesn't matter like at all. You can experience hyper Bitcoinization yourself. You can experience the fruits of aligning with Bitcoin and recognizing what it is and recognizing that you are not Bitcoin's master and that no one is, you can experience it right now. It's, it's there. It's just out for you to pick it up and grab it. Mm -hmm. um, and and in, the same, in the same way, I think we're in a point um, in, in history where, and, and in, in world affairs, where you can very easily experience an extremely free life if you just choose, just choose to grab. I, uh, Dan Dan uh, Princey has the the choose life. And I actually read that book before before starting the world schooling uh, life. <laughs> um, That's awesome. You can you can yeah you can literally choose life. Like you can choose a, a life of pursuing freedom and aligning yourself with freedom. You don't need to wait for every single person in the world to be liberated in this way. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't need all the people to say, well, I'm not going to use Google anymore because it's evil. I'm not going to use Facebook anymore. I'm not going to sell my data for to WhatsApp or to Telegram or to whatever it might be. I can choose to act that way. <laughs>
Yeah. At least in 90% of my life, I can use, or 95% of my life, 100%, I can choose to act in this way and reap the benefits now. Uh, the benefits will only continue to, 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 to increase, but you can take those benefits now. If you don't like the work that you're doing, go, let's just quit. <laughs> and it, this seems, and it's funny because a couple of years ago, I, 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 I was uh, working on projects that were not working whatsoever. And I, I had to uh, look for a job, which I thought that I would never look for a job again in my life. But I had to go and, and, and look for a job. I, I just so happened to find a really cool job at a, at a big company. <laughs> but, um, but I had a, a, a mind of scarcity um, of, of I need to reduce the amount of entropy in my life. <laughs> so where is the next paycheck coming, right? Mm. Um, and and the fact is that to a large degree, you have so like people have so much more agency in creating abundance in their lives if they simply choose to see abundance. Yeah. <laughs> but if you have a scarcity mindset, you will live a scarcity life. It's it's it in whichever way you see life, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You yeah. can see the world as this harsh place where there are no opportunities and you need to, you know, uh go do this horrible horrible job commute that we were discussing before <laughs> recording just commute which is an absolute life soul crushing <laughs> activity that millions oh, and millions of people do so on a horrible. daily basis it's so fucking horrible you simply can choose not to do it <laughs> ever again <laughs> and just don't do it now if you choose that there are side responsibility effects, right yeah there is a responsibility. You just need to man up and take that responsibility and act accordingly. But you don't like the way your government is treating you. You don't like the fact, like I didn't like in Spain that the government didn't allow me to, to leave my house. So I fucking left Spain. <laughs> if, you, if you don't accept it, don't accept it. But yeah. then don't just bitch online, just act accordingly. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a great point. And it's it's entirely... Well, logical and practical, right? Because, you know, dreamers, visionaries uh, don't like either of those sort of labels, but people that think that the future can be better and they have kind of an idea for how tend to be kind of idealistic, right? Like there's not enough freedom mm -hmm. in the world and we need more prosperity and peace and stuff. But as you're saying, I mean, it'll never be to the point where it's perfect. Like you won't just wake up one day and be like, here we go. It's all good Rainbows. everywhere. No, no, no bullshit anywhere. Like there's always going to be problems. And even if you've resolved a ton of them, you're just going to move the goalpost once again to be like, well, yeah, but the, the people on Mars aren't so happy now. So we got to, you know, we can't be, <laughs> we can't settle until they are. And if you have, if you don't balance that properly, then you'll always, as you said, kind of be in that sort of scarcity mindset or that things aren't good enough or, you know, the, they don't compel you forward sufficiently but they don't compel like the best out of you. So I, I think everyone has to find that balance of still striving for, you know, an ideal of a certain kind, whether it's personally or socially or economically, and, you know, be moving toward that and have that pull your potential out of you, but also not allow it to rob you of, you know, the, the current time, right? Not allow that to restrict the motivation you have for embodying some of those principles or values that we referred to earlier. Right. Like it's regardless So one. Yes, you can choose. Like there's a lot of optionality that exists in the world if there's no perfect option. But the other aspect of that is like choosing regardless of circumstance. This is kind of the taken to its extreme. This is like the Viktor Frankl thing. Right. Like regardless of circumstance, choosing which values and principles that you are going to adhere to, i.e. how you're going to act in whatever mm -hmm. circumstance. So even if you do live in the, the communist shithole formerly known as Canada, being a little <laughs> bit, a little, little bit uh, joking there, but you know what I'm saying? Like, even if you're there and it's getting you down, there's still lots of, you know, good around. There's lots of great people around. There's lots of things you can do. There's lots of beauty, all that kind of stuff. And I do, you know, I'm, I'm definitely, I, well, I try to balance that because obviously, you know, I, I feel like sometimes it's too easy to focus on the negatives or the things that are 
you know, holding one back, or at least, you know, you're allowing yourself to believe that they're hold, holding you back. And I think it's important to kind of reset and be, you know, try to be more honest with yourself, frankly, and be like, yeah, may, maybe those are problems, but don't put, you know, take the responsibility for it. I guess it comes back to that, right? Like you, you still have that responsibility to determine how you act and what you're going to contribute your, your, your time and resources to. And um, yeah, so I, I think that's, wise advice that uh despite how things may be one there's a, a, a shit ton of amazing things happening and two you know it's always on you to make the choice about how you respond uh last one because it's also I've... it's also your 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 choice it's also your choice on where you put your attention Absolutely. I, I think yeah. this this is very 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 often um not uh, stressed enough is that if you focus on the things that are that suck about your surroundings, then you're just making those things stronger and yeah. having a, a larger, way larger effect on on yourself. So if you're down, like smile. <laughs> I I do that very 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 often, um, where you just change your posture uh, when you're stressed out or whatever or or like I I climb uh, very often so I I deal with fear in a in a daily basis uh, I'm very used to like that that raw fear I'm gonna die and if you smile at that point I <laughs> it literally I don't know what it does I've read that it does does these things chemically the brain whatever I don't know if that's the case maybe it's placebo whatever it might be but you literally just, instead of focusing your attention on this fear that you're feeling, you accept that that fear is there and then you smile. <laughs> and it creates like this weird connection of, it's not like a, like, um, um, what's it called? Um, like a thrill seeking junkie or something, but you, you, you find you're able to find focus on the thing, on the task at hand because of that fear like that fear drowns you to that moment and you're not just thinking about something else you are like oh, okay i'm scared i like i don't want to die so i need to focus on executing at this at this at this point in time yeah i couldn't agree more and you know part of the reason for not wanting to subject myself give my focus to let's say the twitter algorithm because it puts in my face a bunch of stuff that brings me down you know and i you mm -hmm. you you have to kind of be more, I, I want to be more protective over my attention and cognizant. You know, I think Gigi wrote in one of his recent articles, but like it's an apt way to characterize how we use attention and that we pay it and that whatever we pay it to benefits from that, you know, because we're limited and because we, when we devote our attention to something, it costs us time and opportunity cost. What we, what we give that attention to receives the benefit. So why would you focus on things that objectively you might say are uh, you know, that you don't want or that are bad or that are, you know, non-productive in some capacity. So yeah, self-help book uh, on the shelves in many places, I'm sure. Uh, Pablo, <laughs> what's the, my last question? And thank you for the extra time because I know we're way over, but what, just like you're building a, it seems like a ton of shit. Like, I feel like every day I see something on Nostra where you're like, oh, I, I just built this for that, which is incredible in itself. But uh, what, like in terms of clients or What's got you jazzed up about uh, any particular thing happening in Noster as we speak on uh, May 9th, 2023? <laughs> I mean, as, as far as the stuff that, that I'm working on, without a doubt, the one that has captured my my imagination the most is this uh, highlighter.com that, I, that I'm building, um, which is uh, right now the, the UX is absolutely terrible because I, it as I was implementing it, the idea morphed like six times. <laughs> but the basic the basic premise is that we have demos and amethyst and you know like all the Twitter like experiences that the focus of the um of of the client uh, and the value of the data is the real time component of the data. So the da data that you interact with in, in demos tends to become stale. The, the, the value of the data tends to become stale. So you want to see what people are talking about right now. Not if they, if, if demos were to show you what people said six months ago, the feed is six months ago, it's not as valuable. The client that I'm building with Highlighter is, is a client that focuses on the valuable information. So it's what you would use Evernote or what you would use um, 
uh, what's the other one? A po- Instapaper or Pocket.com or these type of things that you use to manage or or read wise. That's a good one. Uh, it's this type of client of application that you use to interact with. You're reading something that you find interesting and you highlight it, right? Why are you highlighting that? Well, you're highlighting that because you consider that that information that you're seeing is worthwhile keeping in some way. It's it 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 resonated with you in some way. Mm. Usually what happens is that information goes to your Evernote or to your Notion or to your Obsidian or to whatever it might be. And it just stays there. It sits there. Maybe every once in a while you'll go back and you'll look at those notes. Um, But what happens if these notes are actually kept on an open protocol? What happens if other people can see what you're reading, what you're highlighting, what notes are you taking? So you've been reading civil disobedience and you wrote on the side, on the margin of the page, you wrote, oh, this is interesting because blah, 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 blah. That blah, 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 blah. That's the gold. <laughs> like our our friend Svetsky, he, he lent me a book um, uh, when we went to Riga. So on the flight back, I, I was reading the, the book that he gave me, a physical book. On the on this on the margin of, of the page of each of, of multiple pages, there were notes that he wrote. To me, I opened the book. Those are the notes that I'm going for the <laughs> at first. Like my wow. eyes directly go there. Uh, because that's the interaction of our friend Alex with that book. It's not only that book, it's the interaction. And I can, if that data had been stored in Noster. And highlighter, that's where highlighter is going. If that data had been stored in, in Noster, I could have a conversation with Alex, with you, with Gigi, with anyone around that concept, that highlight, that idea that mm. resonated with Alex. And we could all share a conversation around that. What kind of interesting ideas, what kind of conversation might happen? What kind of discovery? might we find if we have that tool? So I've been talking with Gigi a lot about this because- I was going to say that Gigi has been talking about something like this for a long time. (laughs) Gigi has been talking about this for a long time. And the fact is that we, this was not possible before Noster. Right. So I, uh, a friend recommended I read uh, an essay from Gigi that he had published like a week ago, uh, two weeks now, uh, called, purple text, orange highlights, because the idea of orange highlights is I find something interesting in civil disobedience and I share it with you. Well, <laughs> Henry Thoreau is dead, but um, if he had been alive, he could, like, you could send money to the highlight that I made because I'm bringing you that quote. Mm-hmm. And part of that money, so in the case of, of Gigi, I make a highlight on Gigi's text and you see that and you might send money to that highlight and that money is split between Gigi and myself. Right. Now you share that with your audience. And now someone sees that because you send that to your audience. And that the money that your audience sends goes to you, to me, to Gigi, right. to an illustrator, to whomever it might be. And there's the a conversation that can happen. Prism idea, right? Exactly. Exactly. So I read Gigi's article about uh, the, this, this, this essay, uh, man, I immediately started working on it immediately. And then when I published, I, I was talking with him as I was working on it. And then when I published uh, the, the, the application, the first, the first version of the application, he, uh, we got on a call and we were just doing a pleb walk, just walking around and sharing ideas. And the, the, uh, how deep this idea is, I have not finished comprehending yet. I have, I'm not at the bottom, nowhere near the bottom. But this, this idea of highlighter gives us... And again, highlighter is just a client. It, it cannot rug you. <laughs> it cannot take your data. <laughs> someone might come, someone will come, and create a different experience around these highlights. Mm-hmm. And you can experience this communication, this conversation in a different way. The, to me, that excites me so much. And, and if you think about it, you see, again, Evernote, uh, Google Wave, uh, Rome Research, 
notion, all these things. Why, why, why do all these different systems for knowledge management, personal knowledge management systems, continue to emerge, continue to become popular? Because we haven't reached the conclusion yet. We haven't reached the right way of approaching this. And the fact is that the experience of how you should interact with your knowledge, uh, knowledge management system is quite personal. So the way I see it is we, Nostra gives us this global pool of knowledge management, uh, of, of knowledge that we can all keep and interact with. And each developer can create different experiences of how to interact. And those experiences will resonate in different ways with different people, but they will always be completely interoperable among your knowledge management, my knowledge management, Gigi's knowledge management. And I, I just see so much wealth, so much value being created in being able to, <laughs> being able to interact, you know, like highlights for the most part are usually things that you think that they're worthwhile, but they die. Like you don't keep them in any way. It's really hard to go back to a text and actually interacting with them. This gives us this interaction within the protocols. It's insane. Man, I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh, yeah, I, I can't wait. Well, I mean, it's happening now. So I, I just, it's so great, I, I guess is the right way to put it, to be able to see all this happening and these things emerge and these solutions being developed. And then like, I mean, what you just said is a rabbit hole in itself, right? We always talk about the Bitcoin rabbit hole, but like what, so someone could think about what you just said and really it, all these different pathways would branch out from it. And that's, you know, that's that's the mind blowing aspect of it. And to think that like, now we're all on the precipice of like a brand new rabbit hole, you know, combining the two rabbit holes together in oh, a man. sense. I mean, it's just, if Bitcoin was a, like a catalyst for intellectual exploration and development and dreaming and whatever else before, this has just, you know, added a tank of gasoline onto the the little fire that we 100%, had. So. 100%. That's, that's where I've been for the past couple of weeks. It's been, oh my God, this is... <laughs> absolutely insane like <laughs> getting my mind look so i've been using uh highlighter and and one of the things that i built is a way to organize like once you have a bunch of highlights you want to organize them in different ways right so one of the things that i built is like a like a list management system and then i started taking notes of feedback that people give me within those lists but because the feedback that people give me are actual nostr events i can have from my list of things to, you know, like feedback, uh, from that list, I can interact with the people that gave me the feedback. And I can see conversations happening around my to-do list, for example. <laughs> like I, yesterday, someone asked me to, to make a, a modification to something. And I responded to that person from my to-do list application, which is highlighter, <laughs> to that person. That person subbed me, <laughs> and I received the sub on my to-do list application. <laughs> it's when you erase on, these, these, which is what they're trying to get you to change, right? Yeah, like the, yeah, yeah. You know, no, it's it's absolutely mind blowing. <laughs> Man, well, I'm gonna have to chew on all that for a while and and watch how things progress because. Uh, there's so much to think about. So we'll probably have to do this again in another, uh, I don't know, well, six months. Six months will probably be enough time for some, some good stuff oh, to yeah. talk about. <laughs> but if things happen faster, then maybe sooner. But I uh, always great to chat with you, man. And I appreciate you Love making it. the time today and give me some extra time. Are you, You're not going to be in Miami next week, are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm going to be, yeah. Oh, sweet. All right. Well, we'll let's, yeah. why don't we get together there and for a, a drink and continue Love the it. conversation somewhere. Love it. <laughs> All right, brother. Take care. Thanks again. You too. Thank See you. Ya.